2024. If you're watching this and the year is 2095, it means that you are in the future. You're watching a dead man speak. Sure, you've probably visited my grave, brought wreaths, flowers, small toys, little stuffed animals, perhaps uh, some hummus or a kumquat. How would I know? I'm dead. But the most important thing is that I'm coming from the past to warn you. You must always, always remember that truth is more important than lies. That honesty will always allow for a better culture as opposed to lies and deception. And that you must understand, if you've made it this far, that God might start to be getting annoyed at you. First, because you don't believe in him. And secondly, because it makes him laugh. So, future of you, return to God. Be kind and happy. And search deep in the Internet. I'm sure it's not even on a computer now. It's probably embedded in your skull. The archives of what has now become and has been known historically as the greatest podcast in human history. Its name you already know because you revere it. Brad Stein has Issues, hosted by God's comic Brad Stein. Laughter and joy you still watch and revel in as revelatory and inspirational. And all of the sages of your age use my material to try to find the On the side, the ether voice representing the spirit of the age is Wyatt Leroy Stein, the son that I created out of whole cloth because he issued from my loins. Yes, he is known as Loin Boy. And together, God's comic Brad Stein and Loin Boy Wyatt Stein have an archives of material that will keep you sane because clearly you are deep in a bunker after the apocalypse. Welcome, future man, to another edition of Brad Stein has issues and yes getting you through the hell you've endured I'm going to let you hear the haunting music and melody that has helped you hang on enjoy <laughs> Hey folks, it's God's Comic Brad Stein. This is Brad Stein Has Issues, where comedy, conservatism, and Christianity collide in a cacophony of clarity. I am Brad Stein, and that person at the board that started the theme song, 10 Seconds Too Late, thus destroying my monologue, is my son, Wyatt Leroy Stein. You know him as Loin Boy, because he issued for my loins. Wyatt, how are you, son? I didn't mean to do it, but for some reason it, it auto-played. You did what? It autoplayed. What do you mean? The, the, the theme song. Do you mean you had to stop the autoplay and start it over by hand? Yes. Well, why didn't you tell us? Well, I wanted to wait until the end because mm. you were on a roll and the audience probably wouldn't tell you. Yes. I hoped. Wait, it played during my monologue? Yes. Wait a minute. So, How much was destroyed? Like seven seconds. Oh, at the end where I was really summarizing it up into an a incredible climax? Actually, it was more towards the middle. Oh, well, then who cares? Yeah, that was just fluff. I mean, honestly, it's basically one and a half theme songs tonight. Yes, so, you well, know, there you go. So, we, so what you're saying is not that it was a glitch or made us look like idiots, but in fact, we gave them more bang for their buck exactly. tonight. Exactly. Ah. We are being efficient. That's my son. Son, do we got any more subscribers that are going to jump in knowing that now they get a theme song and a half every day? Oh, I sure hope so. If that doesn't convince them, I don't know what does. You know what that is, don't you? That's a mug. What's it say? Uh, my Ten. It says ten. Mighty 10,000, that's the mighty 10,000 well, militia of the mind. Of, it's 
kind of a concave look, uh, mug there, so look, the camera didn't catch it all. Okay, look. Mighty 10,000, bradstein.com, and this question mark with the double stacked M is the militia of the mind. This is our trademark, son. This is what's going to get you through college. And you know why I said that? Because nothing's going to get you through college. It's still stuck here like a scam. Okay, look, it's not a scam. It's just really annoying. Also... Look, I just. Are we really plugging the merch now? Of all times? I'm not plugging merch, I just showed you a m yeah, and merch. Where we, and where can we get the mug? Merch? Dare I ask. Wyatt, I, you think I'm going to sit here and spend time with these people who I adore and show up every week and sit there and say, hey, have you joined the Militia of the Mind? Are you part of the Mighty 10,000? And it's only $3 a month after $36. You can have access to my shows. And if you go for the next the warrior phrase, you can actually download my materials as well as uh, have access to these things. And if you go to the high end, the Special Forces, you'll get a free mug that I'll sign as well as the shirt that I'm signed in number based on your Mighty 10,000 ranking and that you'll have access to all of my material. You can download plus behind the paywall special interviews and guests as well as answers from the guests that you don't get knowing the more normal podcast. You think I'm going to bring that up now? That would be so ridiculous because people would be on to it. They're saying this is a scam. You're just trying to uh, advertise for your subscription so that your podcast can stay remain and as you know i don't do that why i don't care if yeah. they want to join or not yeah you're right what was i thinking no one would have fall for that you you underestimate the intelligence of our people our people are the top of the run they are the prime rib there's the reason that this podcast is the highlight of their week you know who says that no but i know it's someone he says it every time. I'm going to try something different. I don't normally do this. I'm going to close my eyes, and I'm going to act like a mind reader. Uh, I see that Nick Cress is watching us. I also notice that Karen Boyd is saying hi. Ooh, Benjamin Gregory's back. Stan Stinson says hi. Paula Faye Marie Rauchy, my favorite four-named lady, is here. Oh, look, Ashley Haas is checking in. She's the one that always contacts you on text, Wyatt, because she's your buddy. Who else is there? Well, look, it's Cindy Haas. It's Ashley's mom. Hey, look over here, guys. We even have other people that are there, too. Uh, Wyatt, I'm just making this up uh, by mental telepathy. You want to mentally telepathize who you think might be there right now, Wyatt? Help, please. I think Ash. We already said her, though. Yeah, but I wanted to double down. Ah, that's very sweet. You know, she Force believes the polar bear. Forrest Bainey. Who's got the best name of all time? Force. Yes. The Force is with you. Oh, look. The Bush Quacker. Ha, <laughs> ha. He showed up. Folks, I have to assume that I know who's going to be here because you've been loyal followers over and over again. Folks, we have a special guest tonight. Today, or last night, as you know, there was a little, uh, a little sports gathering known as the Super Bowl. It was on last night. And so in honor of sports uh, tonight, we have a very, very special guest. He's a former Major League baseball pitcher by the name of Anthony LaRue. He also has a very interesting story, a fascinating story of things that happened to him, what happened to his life, his family, his physical health, and how he came out the other side and what he's up to now. So if you've never actually had uh, a, an opportunity to sort of get a spiritual dimension and a difficult challenge with someone who's been a professional major league athlete, tonight's your night, you're going to see and listen to a former pitcher. Anthony LaRue cannot wait to get to him. None of you can wait to get to him because he was an Atlanta Brave and a Kansas City Royal. So, Wyatt, this is who we have on. What is your thoughts about having old Anthony on tonight? What do you think you're most excited about listening when it comes to Anthony and his LaRue insights? Well, that's a good one. Because um, I know baseball has been a thing you've been interested in for a while, so... Mm -hmm be interesting to see what insights you have mm. as, you know, someone who actually knows a bit about the world the guest comes from. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I, I played baseball, uh, uh, Little League, all the way up through uh, middle school and high school, and was on the starting shortstop for my senior year of high school. So I did play all the way up through high school baseball professionally. I still have baseball cards, some of which are worth some money. Um, but I really wanted to talk about, you know, what it means to be a professional athlete. You know, I had Mike Fisher on uh, a while ago, uh, quite a while ago, matter of fact. I'd love to get him back on. And, you know, I really asked him a question, and it's the same question I want to ask Anthony is, you know, do major league athletes know they're going to be major league athletes? I mean, is it something you kind of, even you at the highest levels of athleticism kind of go, Man, I wonder if I'm going to make it because it's so difficult. Or do you? Are people of that caliber simply know? Oh, I'm I'm major league. This is not going to be a big deal. And so I ask him these questions, as well as a special magical question uh, that uh, you will only get if you join the militia of the mind to be part of the mighty ten thousand. Now I only give you that not because I'm trying to hawk my merch or get you to subscribe so we can continue, but simply to give you a, an object lesson, a way to. Uh, re-remember things about what we're discussing so that you don't sit there and go, now, what did he say I should join? I should go to bradstein.com and subscribe. I should go to Bradstein has issues on YouTube and like and subscribe and hit notification. I should go to bradstein.com and join up and give him my email so he can contact me and I should be go uh, watching that. That's the things you're going to forget, but not if you go to bradstein.com and join uh, the Mighty 10,000, be part of the Militia of the Mind, then you're not going to have to worry about it because it's going to be right there. Listen, if your name is CB, or like we like to call her, and I don't want to bring it up because I don't want to single her out, so I'll use a code word, Karen Boyd. If you're out there and you received your shirt, uh, I need you to help me by sending me a photo of you wearing the shirt. The reason I say that is because one other person received their shirt and they sent me, emailed me the photo. And I need it from you because we are going to start a series of showing people uh, who have joined up uh, what they look like and who they are so we can become a big, giant, fat family, Wyatt. Do you want to be a fat family? No. Yeah. I, I, I. Yeah, yeah, go on. Well, what kind of family do you want to be? Uh, middle of the load, I guess. Mm, M.O.R. Can we call ourselves M.O.R.s or a more family? We can. We won't, but we can. Well, I want to ask you a question. Sure. You've been working at Lowe's for quite a few years now. Don't remind me. <laughs> And you love it. It's it's something that you um, you just treasure. Um, do they have any <laughs> Do they have any posters uh, that you can put up in your room that says you know I'm I'm a um, I'm a Lowe's employee or I'm part of the Lowe's family? I mean, do they ever do things like that? Like, do you guys ever go to take your breaks and the manager comes in and says you're part of the Lowe's team and part of the family and I want you to. To, 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 to love us and we all are together. Maybe you have Lowe's picnics and perhaps you have Lowe's gatherings where you all get together. Maybe a Lowe's cocktail party, Wyatt, where you all come together in your best aprons and, uh, and a bow tie, obviously, that you fashioned out of uh, cloth that you found on aisle... It was a drop cloth, aisle 10. Yes. That's what I meant, a drop cloth. And you picked it up and you cut it into a bow tie. You've manufactured your own clothing. That's what I wonder about the gatherings of Lowe's employees. Do they demand that they manufacture their suit or their uniform out of materials and or uh, woodworking gear uh, that you have on hand? I don't, I just felt like if people went to Lowe's and somebody, let's say, was wearing some shorts that was fashioned out of two by fours uh, with hinges uh, and then and then held together at the top by by a rope uh, not only would this maybe be a subconscious sell on buy some wood buy some rope buy some hinges but it would be clever because they realize these people don't just sell these products they believe in them they live with them Wyatt 
what have you guys made entire uniforms out of drop cloths or better than that um, some um, steel wool or maybe some netting or some some uh, some some uh, maybe you have flooring vinyl flooring that could be cut into tubes to wear as as arm pieces or or even as as a a, 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 a what would you call it some kind of uh, you know what do they call those things uh, that you put over your head and they're like square and then they just have a cola syrup no I forgot it's a Mexican word what is it sombrero no the ones that they put over their bodies and it has the front and the back but it's poncho. got poncho you could make a poncho out of uh, let's say um, vinyl flooring or you could make a poncho out of let's say uh, metal uh, netting, let's say, for fences. I'm just saying the, um, the, 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 the options are endless for, for each one of the Lowe's employees to, to craft their own um, uniform. Um, and you could even make, you have probably clay there, you could make clay shoes for yourselves. So I'm just saying, wouldn't that be an interesting, unique um, vantage point for Lowe's employees as opposed to the Home Depot where you guys have to fashion your own uh, clothing out of materials that only you sell. Just just, just an listen, idea. Listen, listen. That yeah. might be a good idea and that's exactly why we would never do it. Oh. I mean, put into perspective, the, uh, <clears throat> the geniuses in manager positions in this company. Yeah. I had to go to work yesterday at the night, the, uh, the closing shift. Throughout the entirety mm. of my shift, mm. up until we closed, mm. there were a grand total of 20 customers throughout the entire store. For the whole time. So they're wandering around stealing stuff, clearly. No, no, no. Oh. They're ghosts, because I can't see them. Now, I want you to think to yourself, why on earth would we be so empty mm. at like 7, 6 p.m. on a Sunday? What possible event could possibly be more important than buying a, a rope? I, w <laughs> I want you to think about this right. because my manager didn't. I got it. I think I got it. Yeah. Ballet. They went to the ballet. There's a, there's a ballet uh, a, a group here in Nashville that are starting to put on free ballets for the homeless and for the poor. And people said, let's go support that. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I, did you see the show? The two tutus were made out of plywood. I rest my case. I told you, wouldn't that be the way to do it? So, yeah. Um, two twos made of two by fours. A two two by four. Yes. See? So, yeah, um, <coughs> forgive me for not thinking Lowe's has the intellectual repartee mm. to think that cleverly. So you believe, and I'm, I'm going to ask you seriously, because you could be a manager of Lowe's someday if you're lucky. Uh, what do you mean lucky? Well, because it takes a lot of work. No, 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 no. That is probably, being a manager at a Lowe's is probably the closest thing you could be in to ever being in a legal cult. Really? We had, so every year, and for us it was last week, mm. there was this manager meeting, mm. a giant event in Las Vegas. Okay. And they broadcast it in the, uh, in the training room. Okay. So that we can all look at it. Yeah, and grow in the team spirit and so forth. My goodness, no thank you. I don't understand. So to put it into perspective, um, I, I, I sat in to watch it because okay. I was curious. Yeah. The first thing that happens is a giant, uh, so it takes place in a, like, a, like the Bridgestone, like a giant mm. stadium. Sure. Packed. Yeah. Completely sold out. Mm. Filled to the brim mm. with people who genuinely looked like they would rather be anywhere but there. Okay. Those were all the managers. Mm. Opens up with a musical number from employees doing this whole like song and dance routine. But what I do, this is a, a Lowe's like, basically uh, an earnings call. 
So they go to do the uh, official Lowe's chant, and it goes something like this. Give me a nail. Give me a no. Give me a W. Give me an E. I think I know where this is going. Give me an apostrophe. Give me an S. Okay. <laughs> they actually included the apostrophe, and I lost <laughs> it at that point. I... <laughs> That is. They, like, they held one up too. Like, oh. they, they were holding up. Oh my goodness. So, and by the way, mm. the assistant managers who were in the training room with me mm. were shushing people because that was how important it was. Was he watching? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, every assistant manager was watching, like, intently focused on whatever that was. Mm-hmm. And if you think. That it's all just fun and guy- games? No, they take this stuff seriously. Mm. Last year, mm. three or four managers, mm. ma- managers, yeah. were fired. You know why? Uh-uh. They were two minutes late to the event. It's a cult. There was no other explanation. Now, this is the same people that allow you to return rocks and say, you got to give me my money back. Same people that will allow you to not have a receipt and pay you back. Same people that will not stop somebody from thieving and stealing. Same people that don't care how late you show up uh, to work because they can't fire you. They don't want a lawsuit. But two minutes late to a convention where apostrophes are lionized, they fired them. Yes. And they did it publicly and to shame them? Did they put them in stocks? Was there cabbage involved? Did they pants them? Were they uh, paraded around and made uh, to look ludicrous? Anything fun like that that at least we could show clips of? Unfortunately, no. The manager simply left their store and never came back. And unless you were in on the loop, you'd have no idea what happened. Wow. That is ruthless. It's not only ruthless, it's nonsensical. Mm. Like, So you're saying you wouldn't want to be a Lowe's manager only because the the standard they hold you to is at such a high bar that you simply don't know that you would feel comfortable trying to uh, reach it uh, without failure. And then to fail at Lowe's... (laughs) um, They they celebrated what is quite possibly the lamest, least useful punctuation mark in the English language. Mm. I ain't doing that. Mm. Like, like, is there any punctuation mark that is more pathetic than the apostrophe? Well, had you said you aren't doing that, then you would have used an apostrophe. So I think yes, that it's... but I did not. No, you said ain't, and I think that's good because you avoided that apostrophe just out of spite. And not a lot of people do that, to take an inanimate object, a representation of an idea. It's a representation of Lowe's failings. Mm. So you're not as pro-Lowe's as I was thinking you uh, were. No, no, it's more that I'm, I'm not pro-apostrophe. Like, give me a comma, we all good. A period, question mark, exclamation mark, oh yeah, go, totally. I'll, I'll take a semicolon. I don't care. You know... Apostrophe though? Nah. Well... Miss me with that. I understand, because you did say you are a big fan of, uh, question, of, um, of, um... Yes, go on. There's only like six... What's the thing <laughs> that does this at the bottom so that it it's a pause? Comma. Comma. Well, it's not really a pause. It really just joins... In uh, dependent sentences together. I understand. But a comma is simply an apostrophe that got too big for its britches and went high. Yeah. So I it's think... Also a, it's also an apostrophe that's actually useful. It is useful. Oh, I see what you're saying. A comma is a useful apostrophe. Yes, that's the joke. Good okay. job. Yeah, you got it. Okay. okay. Ten bonus points. No, no. I was trying to give it to those who didn't understand it because it was so lame so they could laugh. Yeah, like you. I got it. I yeah. just... Sure you did. Sure you did. Well, let's talk, if we can, for a moment before we bring on the fabulous Anthony LaRue. Now, folks, for those of you out there who are brand new to Brad Stein Has Issues, uh, that's on you. Uh, I feel sorry for you. You've missed out on things that would have changed your life by now. If your life uh, doesn't make the millions of dollars you had hoped it would, most of that reason is not because you're incompetent. It's because you didn't watch my show and my show has a tendency to uh, drive people to uh, plateaus they never thought possible. 
But here you are, and you're watching now, so I'll give you credit for that. You get it. You're, just, you're going to have to catch up, uh, but nevertheless, you're here. You're trying. And so I want to tell you that we have a, a, a very uh, interesting guest today, Anthony LaRue, a baseball player, a professional baseball player formerly, also played in Japan, also played, I think, in Dominican Republic. So very interesting if you're a sports fan, and I just felt it was a perfect time because of last night, as we record, was Super Bowl uh, 2024. I do want to say something about that last night. So let's take a few minutes for me to commentate. Is that a real worldwide commentate? If I'm going to give them a commentary? Yeah, or... yeah, yeah, yes. I think it's also pronounced commentate, which is again another reason why they are so much better than apostrophes. Because then it would have to be comma apostrophate, and that is too hard to say. Okay, I will give it. This credit, uh, apostrophe is kind of close sounding to apostle, but it's not exactly, so it doesn't count. Hmm. But it has a positive note and a ring to it that can have value if attached to a more important word. That's what Yes, but remember, in that case, it's the word that's important, not the apostrophe. Wow. Well, you're deeper than I ever thought. I am... And it's probably because you sold yourself a shovel and dug a hole. Hey, what can I say? When you hit rock bottom, just start digging. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, if I went into Lowe's, and I'm a neophyte when it comes to digging a hole to get rid of a body, what would you recommend? Hey, I need the best shovel I can for digging a hole. What would you recommend? Well, you see, the thing is, if you're going to be hiding a body, you got to make sure that the hole is more wide than deep. Okay, so um, I need a wide... And I'm not going to say that, because it might... Cause you this is all hypothetical, of course. Oh, that's it. All but it yeah, would give you pause if had I said I need a body shovel diggy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That might just make you wonder if there, so, maybe so the police should the, be uh, the called. The way that you fool the police is simple. You dig a really shallow hole about six feet wide mm. with your shovel. Mm. Then you put the shovel in it. You bury that, and then you hang the body up like they're the ones digging it. So the cops are just like, oh, it's just a guy digging a shovel. Or you dig it shallow, put the shovel in the dead guy's hands, let him fall over, and people find, say, this poor guy was digging a hole and had a heart attack. He fell in the hole he was digging. He is responsible for the very hole he was trying to be clearly digging a hole or to plant some flowers more than likely or or get rid of a bunch of apostrophes he doesn't know what to do with or mm. you dig a hole really deep but really like small take out the shovel and then like have him like crouch down over it like he was digging it with his hands oh he he was digging a hole with his bare hands he was channeling his his idle mole and he just couldn't handle it and fell over and fell in head first. Yeah, his feet then, are just hanging. As oh, poor guy, that must have sucked. And then, as he was digging, he accidentally smacked himself in the back of the head with a shovel sixteen times. All right, well, so listen, I, I I'm afraid that our uh, podcast has gone a little uh, off the rails. I think it what was meant to be simply a hypothetical observation has now given some ideas to some evil people out there. Uh, so just change just your just mind just and be just kind. Just like Find same, Jesus. We are not, we are not condoning Accept Jesus this. immediately and. and Quit setting up not, corpses to be shovel dead if you folk buy a found. Shovel, don't dare, don't you dare dig a hole with it. Yes, but if I was to dig a hole, what Here's shovel would you recommend? I would recommend. Ooh, that's a good question. It depends. If you this is just a one-time project. Yeah. I would say a craftsman would okay. do great because they're kind of more on the budget, but they're still a decent quality. Will they break down on me though? Uh, no, they're not biodegradable, uh, okay. but if you use them more than five times, yeah, they probably snap in half. Okay, okay. Um, hmm. But if you really want to dig, like, holes... And, and, and have a lot of hole digging ahead of me, so I need something that stands up to the test of time, I can well, count on it, it's going to be here for years. What shovel should I get, son? Well, honestly, I wouldn't even go for a shovel. I'd get an excavator. <sighs> Sure, they're a little pricey, but quality costs. You know what, Why? I got to give you credit, son. You have figured out the Lowe's upsell mentality. I'll bet you you were watching that that online conference. I was taking notes. Oh, my Lord. I, I mean, was... most of the notes were how stupid this was, but... I'm notes. proud of you. Did you ever make an apostrophe just to remind yourself in plural how stupid this was? I did not. Well, next time, try that. And by the way, I should say this. And I, and I wanted to say it from the get-go, but we got off on a shovel. 
Because that's how our show rolls. Many people think, is it extemporaneous and are these guys geniuses or are they just babblers? Either way, you're watching, so what does that say about you? I mean, the fact that you can't tell means we've already won. Amen, my son. My son. Listen, last night was the Super Bowl. Did you watch it? <laughs> I understand. Now, folks, that laughter is not a diabolical laughter, though it could be... Uh, it could be interpreted as such. So That's I'm the thinking, laugh of a pure, unadulterated nerd. Sorry, I'm just thinking about who, this, the apostrophe. Of, to this okay, day, okay. can barely catch a ball or throw it up and catch it in his hand. Very talented man. He's my son. He, very talented drummer. Uh, very talented um, um, uh, thinker as far as uh, computer uh, gr pro pro programming, game design, that's what he was really interested in. He's now took the bull by the horns and produces my show. He's my sidekick while he's running all the buttons. He didn't come into this with any experience. He just took took it and ran with it. So very, very, very good. But when it comes to athletics, it's not his strength. It's not his strong point. Uh, and so that was the laugh of a guy going, not only did I not watch the Super Bowl, um, I don't know that I would have even known it existed if it wasn't for the internet not shutting up about it because he does go on the on his phone and I'm sure it pops up banner ads who knows but here's something I want to say about the Super Bowl so hang on America I said to you a few years ago that when the NFL allowed players to kneel during the national anthem, that that was so incredibly disrespectful to our flag, to our nation, to uh, the military that died for them to have the freedom to make money playing football, which is absurd, uh, the most overpaid uh, uh, skill and the most overpaid uh, position of employment I think a human can have other than maybe um, acting uh, is, a sp is a professional athlete. Now, I didn't say they're not good at it. They are. Uh, they're the best of the best. They're the 1% of 1%. Very few people. So it does have a value if you're strictly looking at a economic system of supply and demand. It's so rare if you can make it that you get paid. But it's only because people go to watch. But if professional athletics stopped tomorrow the world would keep going and we'd be okay we'd be okay we'd find other things maybe more productive things to do with our time I played sports I loved it I'm not anti-sports I simply said when it comes to the existential value of professional sports in a culture it's simply not that important and oftentimes can be used as an excuse to not accomplish things because you get so caught up in just paying attention to that, you're not often creating your own world. And that's on you. That's your choice as an agent uh, that God has given you, a free agent. You can choose what to do with your body. If you're a determinist, then, of course, you've made no choices. Everything you got or didn't get is pure luck. I just listened to a conversation between a couple of guys, atheists, who believe that's true. So... I didn't watch the NFL because it was so disrespectful. And I said to you guys on this program a couple of years ago, I will never, ever watch the NFL again unless I am a Christian. So I believe in something that they don't believe in, in critical race theory and in wokeism. I believe in forgiveness if someone repents. If someone says, I made a mistake, please forgive me. Absolutely. I will forgive you and you change your ways uh, and move on. I'm the first to give you credit because I need that too. If the NFL ever said, uh, we made a mistake supporting Black Lives Matter because it's a Marxist organization. Now it is. Uh, the two founders were Marxists, and Marxism is the antithesis of the United States. It hates the United States. It wants it to be destroyed. But an audience was given to them, and the NFL, the largest sporting uh, enterprise in the United States, paid them, I don't know, a billion dollars, something to that effect, I don't know, certainly in the hundreds of millions, uh, and allowed the flag to be dis disrespected. 
all the while expecting people like us, blue collars, to pay their exorbitant prices to go see it and to take money from ads who want to advertise on these shows we watch online and on television. Uh, all the while, they're disrespecting the nation that gave them this freedom and this opportunity that they don't deserve. So I said, if they want to say our bad and we made a mistake, we're never going to take a political position again, and we will allow our athletes, because we believe in the First Amendment, to think and say and believe what they want, but they'll do it off on their own time. I believe in that 100%. Do what you want to with your off time. When you're on a team representing a sport that represents all of those watching from every elk, every Democratic, Republican, atheist, uh, theist, um, conservative, leftism, come together and watch something together that they can appreciate and everything else is sort of fades into the distance and you actually have unity. It has value there. And so if you want to say, I'm going to give a billion dollars as the NFL to military uh, uh, veterans organizations to help them in their hospitals, help those of fallen soldiers, families. We're going to give a billion dollars. We apologize for uh, allowing the disrespect. It won't happen again. We apologize for supporting a political Marxist, hate-filled, anti-American organization. We won't do it again. We're not going to choose any sides anymore. We're just going to play football. Then I would say, okay, that's fine. I'm back in. Let's play. But they're not going to because they know that people will watch them no matter what type of a dump they take on my flag. I know that because many of you watching right now watched. I didn't because I won't watch it. I told you if you're not going to actually sacrifice and do something different than those who despise this nation will bleed you dry, take every dime you will give them until they take over and imprison you for wrong thought. Freeze your bank accounts, do whatever they need to do because you didn't vote the right way, or bow the proper distance necessary for what they demand. So you're part of the problem. I told you when I started Brad Stein has issues that I wanted two things. One, that God Almighty would be honored because I worship him and him alone not the United States. The United States, if you haven't noticed, is dying as we speak. And if people like us don't stand up and say we will not support and will bankrupt into oblivion any business that hates this nation and tries to destroy it, if we don't do that, we will lose the nation. It's for real. It's for sure. It's here. I'm doing my part. I don't know if you're doing yours. That's up to you. But if we become enslaved soon, you can blame yourself if you never disciplined yourself to say, I will do without for a higher cause. During that time, I heard that they had uh, a national anthem. The national anthem means an anthem or a song for a nation, a national nation song. And that's what we sing, uh, the Star Spangled Banner, is our national anthem. It represents every American citizen in the United States. It represents all colors, creeds, genders, ages, sizes, and um, lengths and widths, right? All of us. I heard that they also sang the Black National Anthem. Once again, NFL has decided to take a political cause, irrespective of the fact that there's others that don't necessarily think that's an appropriate place to do that. But they did it anyways because they are still on board with those who despise the nation. But if you watched, you support them. Your money supports them, and they will continue to thrive until America doesn't exist. So I simply have one question. I know what a national anthem means because it's an anthem for the nation. All nations have one. So I simply have a question. It's not an indictment. It's not a, uh, an insult. It's a question. If it's called the Black National Anthem, I simply want to know what nation is this anthem representing. That's all. I just want to know so I can follow along. I know what the United States National Anthem represents. The United States. The National Anthem for Greece represents Greece. The National Anthem 
for Africa, for Sudan, I don't know, for China represents their nation. If it's the black national anthem, what nation are they singing about? And if they said instead, this is a black anthem? Oh, well, then I understand. So what you're saying is this is an anthem that people that have a darker skin color are singing about themselves. The rest of you are left out. It's just for us. But at least I'd understand that. But they don't say that. They say it's a national anthem, which means that it represents a nation. Who is this nation you represent? It's not America, because most people in America aren't black. So it can't be a national anthem for America. Uh, it's not representing... Asian people, certainly not white people, and I guess not brown. If we're going to make assessments based on color alone, skin color, which should have nothing to do with ink, and if you ever bring up skin color, you're a racist, but nevertheless, it's how the world works now, it's certainly how they control things. But if it's called the Black National Anthem, what nation does it represent? That's all I want to know. Now, I doubt there's an answer to that because I really don't know what it would be, but maybe somebody has one. Maybe somebody has something, that we are a nation within a nation of people of a certain skin color that think the same way, act the same way, vote the same way, and are really more beholden to our skin color than to the nation that's given us freedom. That's a call you can make. You're allowed that call. But I just wonder um, how it's helpful, how it's healing, how it's growing the nation in, in a way that can be of any value to us to keep us cohesive. It's, per, it's a fracturing and a destroying of us. And if it continues, and we continue to have isolated songs and anthems, we simply can't survive as a nation because we no longer have any solidarity, any communal ideas, and traditional foundations we can all rely on. That's simply the way it is. If this Marxist crap continues and isn't rooted out and ended. But even more importantly, as I end my little soliloquy, is this. There will be people around the world, and certainly in this nation, that will listen to what I'm saying as we speak, and they will call me a racist. Notice what I didn't do at all. I didn't go and pick out an individual and slam them or but malign them or discredit them or insult them. I didn't. I simply asked, if something is called a thing, I want to know what it means so I can understand it. That's all I did. What they will hear is, because you didn't simply accept it on its own terms, without it needing to be defined, without it needing to have any justification, but simply bow the knee and grovel at our uh, demand that this fits in with everything else. Whether the majority of people want it or not, it doesn't matter. The rule of the minority is Marxism at play. The marginalized now rule because we're victims. If you rule, you're not a victim. You're the privileged. If you get your own song that nobody else gets, you are privileged. If you could just insert it into the most expensive ad space in the world, the Super Bowl, and you didn't have to pay for it, you are super privileged. You are the highest rank in America. You not only you're not a victim, you are so high, I can't reach you because you've been given a special privilege. That's what it used to mean when logic, reason, and observation was simply explored through a monologue, dialogue, an interaction of ideas and words and terminology. We now have people that say logic is racist. I've had people say logic is white. I don't know if I was a minority status, if I could be more insulted than to say that a logic, God-given idea to think clearly about the world so we can draw conclusions is belongs to a particular ethnicity or color, but I would be deeply insulted because logic is God's and he gave it to humans. Everything I just said was simply a question. I will be accused of being a racist. I said nothing racist. But when you have no arguments, no data, no proof that your point of view has validity or is in any way helpful to humanity, you better just start shooting the messenger and insulting him 
That way you never have to justify your cancerous, bigoted, evil point of view. You just shut up those who know what it is and expose it as such. That's what I noticed about the Super Bowl last night. And I didn't watch one second of it. So I ask you, what are you willing to sacrifice to keep America free? Anything? Ever? Or will you wait until you're in the gulag to say, oh, maybe I should have done something while the getting was good? I'm going to let you guys enjoy this conversation. I'm going to try to uh, limit uh, the front portions of Brad Stein Has Issues so that those of you like Karen's and Benjamin's and Nick's that stick around for the whole thing to help us, and I know it's late for you because you're on uh, Eastern Time, I, I, I want to try to help you a little bit by just condensing it so you have less time to have to sit. And you don't have to watch the whole time either, by the way. Grateful that you excuse me, that you do, but just to kind of give you guys some hope and some help as those who watch live um, that will condense this. So we're at 40 minutes now. I might bring it down to 30, the fun up front, and then we'll get to the guest. And that way it's a little bit more manageable for those who want to watch live. Maybe we'll break up uh, some of the interviews into two sections just to help you. I don't know. But uh, you tell me what you think. Please write down in the uh, comments. Uh, do you mind that it goes this long? Would it help you to watch longer? Do you think maybe uh, we should cut down the, the, the banter between white and I up front? I'm not saying I'll do it. I just want to get your thoughts. You're my people that watch every single week. And so I take my cues from you. I, I, I respect so deeply and so appreciative that you show up as fans that I try to use you to help give me some thoughts and gauge as to the best way to move forward. So folks, I want you to please, please, please subscribe and get notifications for YouTube. Please follow me on Facebook. Please get friends to do it as well. Please join the Militia of the Mind in the Mighty 10,000. Please get as many people as you can to do it as well. Let's find those 10,000 to see if we can get them in flux so that we can do what this podcast always wanted to do not just talk about things we agree or disagree with see if we can fix anything i don't know if we can but i'm going down swinging folks the man i'm about to introduce to you was former professional atlanta brave pitcher and kansas city royal he also pitched professionally in overseas and in south america he's got a very interesting story and if you like sports you might find it interesting to see how it works, how you get in there, how you go through the minors, what's it like to really be a professional and how difficult it is to stay there. And also what happens when the worst case scenario takes place in your professional life where you get an injury that should end everything and what might just happen if you believe in a God big enough to fix the impossible. So for all of those watching God's comic Brad Stein, I will be in a couple weeks, a whole time in Pennsylvania. So go to bradstein.com to find out. In the meantime, please enjoy this interview with God's comic Brad Stein and former Major League Baseball player and amazing storyteller, Anthony LaRue. Well, folks, when I speak to different people, I always hope that they have something to bring to the table that I don't. And what I find is that happens every time because I have virtually nothing to bring to the table. I'm just pathetic and miserable But because uh, I'm a comedian. What the heck do we get? We don't have anything. But, uh, you know, God has, for whatever reason, given me this opportunity to meet some really more interesting people than me. Uh, who have m much more unique adventures. But, you know, in the end, we all have our own story to tell. It all has value. God uses everybody's um, experiences, hopefully, to help others. And that's what we're here to do today. Uh, a couple months ago, I was in Alabama. I was working with a... Um, Let's see. I'm trying to remember the particular group. Was it Youth for Christ? Yeah, it was Youth for Christ. Like, I wasn't sure if it was another group, but it was Youth for Christ fundraiser. And some folks came out to the event and watched it, and we got talking afterwards. Uh, and come to find out they're much more interesting than me. And so I thought to myself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put them on my podcast. 
leverage their uh, strength and value and stories so that I can look good. And that's how I do it. It's a, it's, I think Jesus would have done it that way had he been uh, into social media. Uh, but either way, uh, it's a very interesting guy uh, who has something uh, that most men uh, don't have, and that is not only enjoy sports, but participated at the major league level. Very rare, very difficult, and most of us will never do that. So we admire guys like that or are jealous. Either way, here we are. I am here with a former major league baseball player, who has an amazing story to tell, and we're going to get right to it. So please welcome to Brad Sun Has Issues, Anthony LaRue. How do you do, sir? Good. How do you do, Brad? I'm doing all right. I'm hanging in there. I'm a little intimidated because I cut fastballs are hard for me to catch up to. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you had a cutter. If not, uh, you should have because you're with the Braves. Uh, so, uh, but good to meet you. Good to see you again. Yes. Uh, I don't know um, about what it must feel like to be uh, a former major league professional athlete. And I only say that because I said this once to um, – I think it was to Mike Fisher. You know Mike Fisher? He was an NHL guy for the, uh, for the Predators. Oh. Uh, he was a, a, a hockey player, professional hockey player. Right. But I, what I asked him was this. I'm going to ask you that because we got a, you, your story is really in, interesting and important. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get to that. But it's yeah. in, it's, it doesn't make any sense not to talk about uh, part of your life that is, frankly, unique. I mean, it's, it's a rare thing to do what you did, so why wouldn't we talk about that? And men find that interesting. So do women. There's professional women's sports now. Right. Uh, not quite as interesting. <laughs> but <laughs> sorry, yeah. ladies. But, um, but you were a professional baseball player. So I guess the first thing I would ask you that is this. Do people that make it to the major league know that they're better than everybody else at that level? In other words, do, are you aware? It's like, I, I know I just, I can do this, or I have this thing, because everybody's shooting for it, mm -hmm. and this many make it. So right. do, do you guys kind of grow up knowing that you're there, or does something happen somewhere within the process of your experience that you go, man, I think I can go to the, to the bigs? Um, yeah, I would say... Probably 90-some percent of the people that make it are there because they have a God-given ability. Yeah. Um, you know, you stand out. You're always told that you're special type thing. Um, and as long as life goes your way and you do what you're supposed to do, um, hopefully you get the opportunity. Obviously, there's a slim chance that you ever do make it, and I think that's always in the back of your mind, but you're – determination and your your will to keep working hard to get there um you know it causes you to make sacrifices mm -hmm. um and start to uh kind of put you know something obtainable in the world above what's really important it kind of you know it has to be your priority um essentially to uh climb that ladder mm -hmm. so uh you know that's but i mean i guess what i'm curious about is do you Do you have a sense that you have something that others don't? I mean, you're 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 an athlete starting as a kid. Mm -hmm. I played baseball, little league, pony league, coat league, high school. So I played uh, competitively, but obviously wasn't good enough to become even a, a decent college player, let alone that. And you know it. You yeah. just you see different guys go that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I met like I had a real experience uh, with that. So I played. Uh, Baseball is a shortstop, my final year, senior year. And there was a guy from another school. It was a small school in Indiana, but there was a guy from another school who was one of these guys that everybody knew was the hot athlete for the, you know. And he ended up playing, actually, uh, football for Notre Dame. So, you know, he was, yeah. he was at a pretty high-level dude. But this was the guy that just dominated. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, he is batting. And he did hit a home run, home run once. But... I had this sort of thought that maybe I could make it, you know, shoot for the majors. Maybe, you know, i got to do it a little by little. This guy comes to bat. He hit a ground ball. Mm -hmm. 
between short and third. I'm short stuff, so just. <laughs> now I had taken ten thousand ground balls in my lifetime. Yeah. I had practiced backhand, forehand, making the dives, doing the moves, made a few cool plays in my life, but had taken over and over and over again ground balls, yeah. fly balls, mm -hmm. line drives. Did it. This guy hit a ball, and it w it didn't just go like that. It went. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah. that's one thing I said to myself in my head. I'm not a major leaguer, because I had never seen that. Now I realize now it was top spin that that guys that are got the strong wrists and whatever, yeah, put on to them. And now of course you played, so you know what those guys can do with a bat. Oh yeah. I've got hit by a couple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew at that second, this is some I've never seen before. And that's when I realized there's an elite status. And the other uh, experience was a, a player that I grew up uh, in, in Little League, same guy. Uh, not same guy, but the same scenario. Dominated everything. All-star, dominated. Went mm -hmm. to opponent, dominated. Went to high school, dominated. Went to USC, dominated. Went to minor leagues, dominated, 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 dominated. Triple A, was with the Kansas City. Mm -hmm. I think it was Dallas. It might have been during the Bo Jackson years, I guess. But anyways, that he came up for like I guess what you guys call a cup of coffee. Yep. He was up for thirty days. Yeah. Couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. Ended up he was lefty, so he went up trying to rebuild his career by being a pitcher because he wasn't able to. My point was at every level, this guy was clearly a major leaguer, except from AAA to majors. That leap isn't just another incremental step. It's a whole different thing. So that's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. What in the world is that extra whatever that puts you into a category that, that even the best that we grew up with couldn't breach there's something else you have now maybe you feel odd about this you're like oh yeah i feel like you're saying mm -hmm. but you did it yeah so what the heck is that um i mean the cup of coffee thing probably usually happens because of when you get up there so many doors open that weren't open before like the minor leagues coming up through they basically own you um and you don't get paid anything mm -hmm. you know you're moving around um state to state you're you're making you know, there's some lawsuits actually uh, for guys that used to play that they're trying to get compensated mm. um, because of it was unfair wages, essentially. Um, so whenever you get there, the, the difference from being a minor leaguer to a major leaguer is so much different. And then, um, you know, it, the scene of partying and stuff like that. Um, you know, if you don't, if you don't have faith and a good, strong foundation in God, which I didn't. You can get mixed up in that kind of stuff really easily because it's like, oh, well, this is this is what everybody does. This is what mm. you're supposed to do when you get here. Mm. Um, and so once you start to live that lifestyle, then you kind of start to put the other stuff on the back burner. Mm. And then before you know it, um, you know you're 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 struggling yeah. you know, for the first first time ever because now you have you're trying to do what you're supposed to do on the field but you're doing all this stuff off the field that's taken mm. away from your performance on the field. Mm. And you don't, you know, it can sneak up on you real quick. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, like in high school, um, coming up through three sport athlete, um, I mean, T-ball, I hit a home run every time. You know? <laughs> there was no, there was no fence and it was like the right. coach pitch. Right. And it was like, every time I hit the ball to the outfield, it was, they wouldn't catch it. And I just, I'd Were you left-handed or right-handed? Left-handed okay. hitter. So I do everything left-handed except for throw. Interesting. So I kind of got the short end of the stick. If I was a left-handed pitcher, I'd probably still be pitching. Yeah. Left-handed with the heartbeat, you know what I mean? I'm they just they you, pitch forever. They really want the lefties for yeah. some reason. So, um, and left-handed left people have a weird brain, you know? So I yes. think that's why I loved when I, you came to that church and were speaking, and I just, I, was, and I think I've, you know, I've watched and heard you on YouTube before, but I just, I know now in my life, um, after chasing all that kind of stuff that I want to stand on the rock and you know the, the rock is the word of God and um, 
and hearing yeah. you speak at that church and kind yeah. of the stuff that you're speaking about, like, you know, I want to be a soldier for God. Yeah. And so, like, I want to stand up for what's right. I don't want to be, you know, man manipulated into, like, accepting things that shouldn't be accepted um, and all that kind of stuff. But as far as being an athlete to get to that next level, I think it's a lot of stuff off the field that you have to do right. I mean, there's people watching everywhere. Um, and when you're wearing – their name on your chest they want you to be that person off the field on the field um and you just you got to work hard you got to put in the extra work I, like i said you got to live it but what I, I i mean and obviously what you're saying totally makes sense um i mean i'll, I'll never know what that world is like i i mean maybe in some tiny little way because in the entertainment business mm -hmm. when I was in uh, comedy clubs and nightclubs certainly not the level of being a professional athlete but you know you're the star right that people came to see and afterwards there you're in a bar there's plenty of free drinks because you're I mean so and it's an atmosphere of people that came to party and to be fun yeah. so clearly um and you're bored yeah. I mean, you got a lot of downtime now. You guys have to get to the to the, the field, I think, fairly early and warm up and prepare. So there's hours ahead of the game that that you guys have to go through. That, but my point is, so much of the of of waiting to spend an hour on stage is 23 hours and having nothing to do. Mm -hmm. So you fill fill in time because you're bored. So it can it can certainly lead to the wrong oh, yeah. to the wrong choices. Yeah, well, you're I mean, filling just, your time with just, yeah, yeah <laughs> filling it with. But I guess, in a, and I don't want to belabor it, so, you know, I, I just, I guess as somebody who, who played a sport, who loved a sport, uh, enjoyed athletics, I got involved in martial arts for a while, just, just as a guy, I enjoyed athletic mm -hmm. stuff, and I still exercise and whatever. <clears throat> but most men, if they're sports fans, most of them, once in a while, you get the nerds that just were always the guy that would, I'll just write, you know, I'll take the scorecard and whatever, the and they know all the analytics yeah. and whatever, and that's fine, too. I yeah. mean, you know, they, they found what they could, how they could involve themselves in the sport because they couldn't do it athletically. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess what I was just, and maybe there's no answer, but I noticed this about life. I've been in, I've known a lot of uh, musicians. Mm -hmm. Actors, you know, I've done a lot of the eclectic elements of, of performance art, mm -hmm. okay? And virtually everybody that I've ever come across says the same thing. They, yeah, I can act, oh, I can play piano, oh, I can sing. I can't imagine being stand-up comedy. If something about that thing makes them, like, go, that's beyond, that's crazy, yeah. are you saying? And I'm going, these are people that are very successful and yeah. aren't really afraid to be in front of folks. Something about stand-up comedy just intimidates him, like it's a different beast. Okay, not me. I enjoy it. So what I learned was, but I was given that gift. I don't know how yeah. not to do this. Yep. I know how to think funny. I know how to behave. I'm not intimidated. It inspires me to get on stage. I enjoy that experience that most people fear. Yep. I find invigorating. Okay, so what I learned was we tend to discount our gift and expound on somebody else's. Whatever I can't do, I give a superior value to because oh, yeah. I don't know how, well, for somebody that grew up and, and, and you had to work hard, you had to hone your skills, but there's no question that guys at elite level have a genetic advantage yeah. they were given that somebody, I can't throw a 95 out, I can't. Yeah. My body doesn't have the, the, the mechanics to do that. You could, you didn't earn that, it was given to yes, you, was and then you learned how to hone it mm -hmm. and to get better. So I guess all I was trying to understand was maybe you, you guys are in the same boat. If you've, all you've ever known is I know how to be great at sports, it doesn't feel like you did anything because I don't know how else not to be good at sports. Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, and I think that's probably why like, I, don't, I don't really feel special. Um, you know, Sports was my outlet kind of to – be out of the house you know so that's all i ever did i'd go to the school at five in the morning and i'd work out with my uh football coach's brother who was the wood shop teacher yeah so i'd work out with he was you know so he set good foundations and how to work out good like and he held me accountable 
So I'd go work out with him, then do school, and then after school I would have a sport or I would be lifting again after school okay. with someone. So like that was my kind of way of of not being at home. Mm-hmm. And not to say that my home life was horrible, but it was challenging. It was different. Um, what do you mean? Uh, I just looking back on it, just remember a couple things that were, were difficult, like tough love. You know what I mean? Um, from your father, you mean, or uh, both, both parents. Okay. Yeah. Tough love as in, in retrospect, they did well because they were being disciplined or you feel like maybe there was, it wasn't necessarily the healthiest Uh, way to help you i mean i don't think there's a handbook of parenting and i'm not like saying that i was the best kid or the worst kid i don't know um i just know that you know your parents go through stuff in life um that you don't really know about and if they don't if they don't get the help for it that they need then it can kind of snowball and get be taken on the kids or whatever like and um you know my mom's dad was kind of not, you know, he was abusive. And then my dad's dad passed away when he was 40, um, just getting a simple surgery as some hemorrhoids tied off. Mm. And one of them broke. He got gangrene and died. Wow. So, um, you know, and this is something I'll say just because I called my dad out on it. I was like, why don't you say you love me? Mm. Like, and, um, you know, I had to do it a couple times. And it's just, it was one of those things where, like, it was – it was just something that you didn't say. Guys yeah. didn't say that back then mm. type thing. And more than likely his dad didn't tell him to say it to him. Well, his dad was a really awesome Christian man. Okay. And, and so was his, his mom. Like, she was the one that would cook every Sunday. Like, you know, all, the, all of us would go over there for picnics. You know, she'd be cooking, rolling out dough for, mm-hmm. you know, chicken pup pie. And, like, everybody would come there, and, like, she never complained. She never – she was such a godly woman. And, you know, um, she ended up having breast cancer, overcame that. Um, and then later in life it came back and it was in her bones. Mm. Um, but just held strong to her faith the whole entire time. Like just really awesome woman. Um, and kind of once that generation of grandparents passed away, everything kind of started to fall away. Like we didn't get together on Sundays anymore. Mm. Like they were like a really good Christian foundation that were mm-hmm. kind of holding everything together. Mm. And then once they were kind of gone, I feel like, or, and my grandma was on the downside, it was like stuff kind of had to fall apart. And then I was going my old, old, old own way with baseball and like the sacrifices that I told you about to get there. Like she passed away and it was, you know, I was at a position in my career where it was like, okay, they give you three days when that happens. Um, but it was kind of like told to me that like, if you go type thing, you won't be called up. Oh, so they make you guilty and to like, what's more important. Yeah. So that's what the sacrifices are, you know? Um, and that's, that's one thing that when I share my testimony, because of what I've been through and everything is, you know, you see a lot of times now parents paying $1,500 for their kids to play travel ball at 11 years old. He's throwing 68. Like who cares if your kid is throwing 68 at 11 years old? Yeah. Let your kid be a kid. Mm. The chance that he is going to make it are so slim. And if he is going to make it, make it, you're going to know and people are going to come see him Mm. and you don't have to pay all this ridiculous money for like, it just, it, it kind of hurts my heart a little bit because I feel like a lot of um, people take advantage of kids for yeah, that purpose, of course. kind of build them up and like, and then the next thing you know, they're not playing football because, oh, I don't want to get hurt for baseball. Mm-hmm. Well, we don't plan our lives. Yeah. You know, we just live them. Um, if you try and, and plan your life like I did, like I, you know, I thought I had everything mm-hmm. until I had everything that I thought I was supposed to have and realized I was empty. Mm-hmm. Um, which I'm sure we can get into that. And we will, more. yeah. You know, like I said, I, I, I realized that, uh, that you know, this is a, a, was a part of your life. It certainly doesn't define you, certainly anymore. You've moved on from that and have had uh, uh, quite an adventure since then. Of course, that's where we're going to go. But yeah. I just felt like I wanted to establish this one thing because it's simply not 
something everybody gets to do. I can't decide, I'm going to be a major leaguer for a little bit, and then I'll try that, and then I'll move on. Yeah. You, you can't do it that way. And that's why, I, I've, because I, I was interested in athletics and whatnot, uh, the few times that I get um, uh, professionals, uh, I'm just curious about their mindset. Like, did they, you know, did they know they were going to... I'm guessing most guys that play hardcore assume that's certainly what they're shooting for. I just mm -hmm. didn't know if you ever knew in your head or your heart, you know what, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to get this th here after all. Or if you just kind of suck it up and one day... Out of the blue, I can't believe it, they called me. Or if you just knew, I'm going to be in. I know I've got this thing. Or maybe that's the mindset you need. I don't know, man. I just... Yeah. I mean, I, the way I was performing, you know, in the minor leagues, and, and like you said, just hitting every level and just dominating, essentially. Yeah. Um, you know, there was times where I was like, I should be called up. Like, why, yeah. why am I not getting called yeah. up or whatever? But, I mean, at that time, the Atlanta Braves had, like, yeah. Maddox, Maddox right. all these guys, yeah. you know. So, like, had I been on another team, right. maybe i get called up sooner. But at the same time, if I get called up sooner, maybe i go down that bad path sooner mm -hmm. and don't. You know, so um, they definitely, my off-the-field stuff maybe, maybe hindered that, too, just mm -hmm. because I wasn't, like, reading books. And that kind of, I was kind of like the clubhouse clown, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was the guy that would do shaving cream man when it mm -hmm. rained. Like, come out with just shaving cream right. over everywhere with my eyes out. And, right. like, you know what I mean? Just, I love to make people laugh, too. Um, and, you know, it didn't matter if I was embarrassing myself to do that as yeah. long as everybody else was having a yeah. good time. But sometimes that can that can be a detriment mm. to you because then it, it makes it seem like you don't care. Mm. Um, just or because you're always... Not taking things seriously yeah, or whatever. Yeah, so, you know, if we'd be losing or whatever, it'd be like, well, like... You can't let that ruin your life. Like you're gonna, you're gonna fail, and that's probably one of the things. Like you're gonna fail in baseball. The best, the best players hit 375. That's failing 75 percent yeah. of the time. So it's not when or if you fail. You're gonna fail. It's how you come back from that failure. So what are you gonna do to make sure you don't feel that bad again? Or how, what are you gonna do to make sure that you don't, you know, you don't embarrass yourself like that again when you go out there? And then that, I think, is what gets you to the step above to where you need to be to where they're like, this kid has it, maybe. So when you got called up by the Braves, was that who you called up with first? Yes, sir. The Braves. Mm -hmm. and, how, and were you there the whole season? Was it half season? What? So it was like at the end of the year, they expand their rosters. Okay. And so I was like 21, I think. It was 2005. And so I got called up at the end of the year um, in September. And um, that's when, well, so when I got there, like, I think she was, that year I went from Mississippi, so that's double A, to triple A, to the big leagues all in one year. So before that, kind of went, got drafted 2001 by the Braves, went rookie ball, Gulf Coast League, Florida, um, did really well, went to advanced rookie ball, which is in Danville, Virginia, um, then went to Rome, which was the first year for that stadium, um, and that was single A. And then there was Myrtle Beach High A, and then Mississippi was the next year, and that was the first year for that stadium. And it was like Mississippi, Richmond, Virginia, which was triple A, and then big leagues all in the same year. Mm. So, and, and then did you carry over to the next year? Were you still up? Uh, or? So <clears throat> I got sent down the – last day of spring training to triple mm. a and then kind of roller uh, roller coastered up and down that's gotta suck yeah yeah i mean one day you're like i'm in i'm in oh. yeah i just I, I threw really hard i think they were uh looking at me to be like a closer or something but i couldn't throw strikes at the time uh. like um which was something that i usually could always do but i had a a bump in my velocity um just from because it was pretty much an all-year-round thing. So I went from being in high school to being good and not working at it, just playing all these different sports but being good, um, to now this is all I'm doing. Yeah. Strengthening, all that kind of stuff. And then I think once you hit probably around 20, you kind of start to get that different strength mm. that you know you didn't have when you were 
a young pup. Yeah. Um, it starts, how far? How how fast could you throw? What was, uh, what so was I was your highest rate? like anywhere from eighty eight to ninety nine. So when I learned what? how to, when I learned how to pitch, <laughs> eighty eight like, to ninety nine. Yeah, That's so, gigantic difference. Yeah. So eighty eight to like ninety five is where I would usually pitch at. Okay. So like you know, eighty eight to ninety one, ninety two would be like location stuff. Mm-hmm. Get ahead in the count or something and let one rip. Mm. Um, but then yeah, there was a couple years right before Tommy John. And maybe it was my arm just like got yeah. super loose because it was about ready to go, but it was like I never dropped below like ninety seven. Got you. Uh, well, and that was another. Uh, I, that was another thing that just reminded me of that. That difference was a, a guy that played shortstop uh, the year before uh, in junior year, and I was second baseman then. <clears throat> but I remember uh, screwing around at first base, whatever, when we were practicing, he would throw the ball, and it would rise. Mm-hmm. I'd never seen that. So, again, it was this other thing that it's like, how do you, what do you, and they don't know why. They don't yeah. know. They're, they just, there's something else going on here that makes you go, I don't have that thing, so <laughs> I guess I can't possibly. But anyways, um, uh, so you did play, you and then did you end up with another team at any point? Or? Yeah, so 2005, uh, when I first got called up that September, Tim Hudson was coming from Oakland. Okay. And, uh, you know, I've always been, like, a baseball fan. I was always a Braves fan as a kid. <clears throat> Braves and Phillies. Mike Schmidt was awesome back in the Darren Dalton with those yeah. curls, you know. Um, Lenny Dykstra with the big old yeah. on his lip. Um, but uh, Sid Bream – was yeah. with the Braves. He mm. came to my church one time, so just was always a fan of them too. And um, when Tim Hudson came to Atlanta in 2005, and I just had gotten called up in September, you know, you don't have a place to live. So I think that's where I was going with the double A, triple A stuff. Every time I would get called up, so that year I went from double A to triple A to the big leagues. Like my wife now, um, we've been together since. 10th grade nice so high school sweetheart but <laughs> so she was in mississippi mm. you know and it's like you get called up you're leaving tomorrow mm. you know so she's in an apartment stuck there yeah. with trying to figure out how to get everything moved and mm. then it's like by the time she gets to like richmond okay you're getting called up wow. and now we just got another apartment and Ooh. it's like you know they ha- they do have places set up where you can get like uh short-term leases and mm-hmm. stuff like that but it was essentially it's all put up on her to be wow. able to do all that you stuff. You think the teams would have a way to help the players integrate or whatever. But yeah, I no, they, I mean, they take care of you as far as getting you where you yeah. need to go and stuff. But as far as, like, what you leave behind and all that stuff, wow. it's kind Good of luck. just, yeah. yeah. So I noticed uh, Kansas City was in the bio, so I didn't know if that was somebody you ended up getting traded to and then ended yeah. up come up with them or if you were just in their yeah, system. Yeah, so I uh, – Tim was like, hey, you need a place to live, like, type thing. And then, so, I lived with him and his family. Um, like, every spring training um, and whenever I would get called up. So, instead of having to, like, rent somewhere or whatever, like, I would stay with his family in the basement of, of the house. And so, that kind of was where the seed got planted on how to be, like, a good Christian man. Like, his wife was amazing, like, and just... Um, Stuff that I noticed that I didn't really have as a kid, you know. Um, is that typical that a, a, a player will take in a rookie guy that's in transit? Is that kind of a standard thing, or was that it, something it, he just did on his own? It was. Uh, back in the day, like, older guys would, you know, they would take care of the younger guys and kind of, um, and I, I think that's probably dying out now because mm. um, there's not a lot of respect for guys that have been around the game for the mm. younger guy. You, you can see it. Okay. Um when you watch it now um but back in the day it was yeah the older guys you know they would help you out they would steer you they would they'd be hard on you yeah. you know they'd tell you like hey you need to or whatever so uh because somebody be, probably did that for them and they're just passing it that's on. it yeah yep and then i think you know i could start to see it change towards the end of my career to where it was like the younger guys didn't care about the older guys okay. so much and then it was just like, it's, it's all about me. Well, the reason I asked you was, uh, especially when you mentioned uh, the Braves and their, their, uh, uh, their starting rotation, I don't know if, if that was Maddox and Glavin and uh, if it was those four guys, who was the other guys? Um, 
I forgot. Uh, anyways, yeah. but I know if those were the guys that you were suddenly in in the world with because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, What's that like? like? You know, watch the... those guys going, you got to be kidding me. Oh, yeah. I cannot believe yeah. I'm on a team with, you know, Greg Maddox, and can I just watch how you prepare? Can I see yeah. how you get into a game and just watch what this guy does? Because it must be just exciting mm -hmm. to see how people at that level do their work and what you learn. And what do you learn from people that are at that elite level that you never saw anywhere else? Uh, by anybody else do they what do they bring to the table that you clearly see no wonder uh this dude does what he does probably their work ethic but and i always hear that yeah. what does that mean so just the way they mentally prepare and go about doing things like their routines their keystones like what they have to do before they do something they don't just pick up a ball and just they have purpose behind everything um but by watching them and being told like, hey, you need like I was told, like you need to slow down your mechanics. You're too quick. Um, we want you. And to would they tell you? Would they take time to bring that to the table, yeah, or was so it usually the coaches? Then? No, the coaches. Okay. The coaches would. And then they'd be like, you're gonna watch. Let's just say John Smoltz. Yeah. So I watched him a lot. We want you to do it like this. Well, what you quickly realize and figure out is we're all unique. Yeah. And no, pe no two people are alike. So what works for him, going slow in his mechanics, being methodical and getting balanced, which is huge, and then releasing the pitch, works for him. Mm -hmm. If I go slow and do all that, my timing would be messed up. <clears throat> okay. And I would I could throw the ball over the backstop. I guess. Like I was, maybe it was my brain, you know, ADHD. But you get the no ball, idea. I'm ready to pitch. Let's go. That's it. Yeah. I was I was quick. I was I was a guy that was like, as soon as he puts the sign down, let's go. I didn't like to think. Can you think of a guy uh, that is similar to that? That is somebody we would recognize, like a quick pitcher uh, that had more of that faster uh, style. Because I know that that hitters. Mm -hmm. If if that's who you are, they're going to back out. So you're not going to rush me. Yeah, and yeah. they're going to try to throw you off. You. Yeah. So I didn't know if that almost almost can be challenging because the hitter's not going to allow you to get into your groove anyways if he can help it. Yeah. Um, and nowadays there's there's like rules out on like yeah. that kind of stuff. <laughs> I can't. It's like I can't take it. Yeah. I can't, I can't either. take I can't that either. I can't that either. thing. Uh -uh. It's the DEI of 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 sports. They're destroying everything. Like you know, and we got to just sort of. I mean, I get it. Baseball is, I mean, we live in, a, in an age where everything is fast and quick, and you look on the, the Internet, and it's a 20-second thing. And we uh -huh. and baseball is a slower sport. Yeah. I also noticed that people that were big fans over the years of baseball were usually intellectual people. Mm -hmm. You always saw these higher intellectual folks uh, uh, that um, – uh, seem to find baseball compelling. They love the analytics of it. They love the data parts. That was just unique. That's what Moneyball was all about. Was yeah. there's ways to perceive where a value is that isn't necessarily by the gut of. Mm -hmm. I, I just think he's a good match. And he's like, no, he isn't a good yeah. matchup for this guy. Lefty on lefty, not necessarily. It's like what? And yeah. the old school guys are going, no, no, no. We know how to do this. Yep. And here came this new way of seeing. Did you experience any of that? Yeah, I'm for sure, especially when I was coaching and stuff. Like, I think it can be used as a tool, right? Analytics can be used as a tool, but it doesn't define the the character or the heart yeah. of the individual. So, like, you know, nowadays it'll be like, well, you know, your numbers are this and this, so you can't make it. Well, that guy could get on the field and just absolutely ball out. Yeah. But he's not given the opportunity because – these numbers say that somebody with these yeah, numbers can't do that. And, and they lose that in, instinct, I think, of the, that the manager used to have to say, you know mm -hmm. what, I'm leaving you in. I'm leaving yeah. you in. I don't know why, but I just think you got this. And, of course, a pitcher is going to always try to talk you out of being pulled out of oh, it yeah. anyways. And now managers are told, like, hey, no, you got to pull this guy type thing. Like, the, yeah. the analytics say if he's in longer than this. Yeah, you get 48 pitches and you're yeah, done. Yeah. Like, if what? he goes past six innings, he's yeah. going to give up a run for sure. It's like. <laughs> How do we know this? This is a playoff game. You know what I mean? I like, this is know. when he can step up, and but he's not even given the opportunity because of 
because of analytics. So I think you know that can be a tool, just like our phones can be a tool. But yes. if we let them, if we let them dictate everything we do, we're going to be slaves to them. Well, I want to move into your story. This is really important, and, and we're going to do that. I just wanted to kind of take advantage of that unique experience you had in the major leagues because I think people find that interesting. It isn't something everybody gets to do, uh, and people like sports. And so to hear from somebody who really got to do that inner circle you know it's interesting guys like this that they don't only get to watch it um so i'm good but i i'm before we move into the next phase um i just want to ask one more kind of sports question just because it's interesting to me mm-hmm. so are there any freaks as an athlete as a professional who probably understands uh, the history of the game somewhat, or at least had an awareness to a certain degree. You, you know, you said you grew up liking the Braves and whatever. And I don't know how old you are, but if you grew up watching them in the '70s, you would have seen Hank Aaron and guys mm-hmm. like of that caliber. But pitchers, I I grew up in Southern California. I was always a Dodger fan, but I would go see the Angels because that was the American League team, so it gave me something to do for that. And they had Nolan Ryan. Well, that dude, if you look at his stats, is ridic- he, he, he doesn't yeah. make any sense. Uh, what he could do for as long as he could do and throw as hard as he could for as long as he did and his arm not blow out doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Am I wrong? No, no, you're not wrong. What did yeah, he's a freak. 5,000 <laughs> strikes. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Seven yeah. no-hitters. I think 30-something. One. He's the Nobody's ever done anything close to what this guy's never won to Cy Young. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, so it's a lot harder to do stuff back in the day. <laughs> okay, so but if you looked at his win loss, now probably the other problem, of course, is oftentimes you're with a crappy team that's not giving you any run support. Yep. So it's like, what do you want me to do? I gave up two. You gave me one. Yeah. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. But um, I guess it just it just came to my mind, and I just wanted to ask a, a pitcher who. Is he somebody that a pitcher, I don't care even if the guys that have reached higher levels like, a, a, I don't know, Clemens who had whatever, five Cy Youngs, what, you know, so, but do they look at a guy like that and go, dude, you're a freak? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. I've, I've <laughs> and my, my buddy Tim, he, uh, he calls me the Neanderthal. Just because he's like, you're the missing link. Like, just because <laughs> when, I, when I do stuff, like, there's just something that I was born with, you know, like it was a God given ability to be able to do certain things in a freakish manner. Um, whether it's picking up stuff or moving stuff or not doing anything for a long time and then just being able to do it. Mm. Um, it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's, I look at Nolan Ryan and I'm like, dude's a freak. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, and what is it that most as a professional, uh, pitcher from a professional pitcher what most impresses you about his career than maybe a, a fan there's something about him as a pitcher to go i don't know how he possibly did this that doesn't make any sense well just the amount of innings that he threw um and how hard he threw consistently with you know you know that he wasn't feeling 100% all the time because you never feel 100% Mm. any of the time when you're pitching because it's so unnatural. Mm. So his and his legs were probably, i never seen him in person, but I'm sure when he was pitching, like I'm sure his quads were huge. So that's uh, where the power comes (laughs) is your legs. Yeah, yeah, legs. um, But his just to be able to, to throw his mindset, he was probably in pain. Mm. A lot of the times, but you never knew it. Mm. Um, and he would pitch through it. Uh, you know, he was tough. Yeah. It was, he had to be. You know what else is interesting, too, is being a Dodger fan. Um, we had Sandy Koufax. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and again, I, as, like I said, I want to get off in your story, but it's, I just find this interesting talking to you uh, because of your insight. It does look like, for me, that even the mechanics of a left-hander seems looks different than a right-hander. That doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't it just be a mirror image? Yeah. But when I watch a Sandy Koufax and the way he threw, I, I'm going, 
That's beautiful. There was yeah. something beautiful about the way he, th mm -hmm. I don't know why that makes any sense to anybody, but maybe just as an athlete, you appreciate the, the, the kinesiology or whatever they call it of, of the body. Yep. Um, he, Ryan, I like the way he, he pulled his leg. I don't know. I just enjoyed watching the mechanics. I guess that's what athletes do. But it didn't look the same. Lefties yeah. seem to have a dip, even hitters. Mm -hmm. It looks like they, they, it swings differently. Is that even true, or am I just not understanding what I'm looking at? Yeah, I would say, I mean, we see, there's not, you don't really see too many, like there's not that many good left-handed pitchers. You know, that's mm -hmm. why they're, when you do find them, they're so, they stick around so long. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say they're definitely unique. Like if you look at Kershaw's mechanics, yeah, if that guy was right, it's weird. If that guy was right-handed, he yeah. would blew out his arm like. Yes, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're like, that's right. How does he do that? It's, it's so jerky yeah. and and it feels sloppy, mm -hmm. almost like I don't know why you're effective. You don't yeah. look like you know what you're doing. Yeah, and he but does. Stud, but yes. absolute stud. It works for him, his body. Like, but yes, it looks completely different than a right-handed yes. pitcher. And then, do you know him? Not personally. You met him? Uh, no, no. Never I've met never. Nolan Ryan. No, I've been in the same room with nolan ryan but okay. it when he was much older okay i just curious so, well yeah. listen this has been a great kind of lead up to uh probably the story that's more interesting to you now in your life and we don't want to forget your history it all had a purpose yeah and everything that had happened to you and and something did happen yeah. to you uh that moved on i don't want to try to set that up that'll be up to you but I don't know if it was a direct result of you were a pitcher and then something happened or if this happened later but why don't you quickly tell us kind of the the challenge that kind of launched you into the new phase in your life because of something you had to yeah uh, overcome so as I was saying like when when you get called up to the big leagues you know all these other doors open and um, you know so I kind of growing up never drank never really got into drugs or anything like that and then get called up to the big leagues and you know, the first car you get into is with a guy, and he just reaches in the back, and grabs a cooler of beer, psh, here you go, kid, like, you made it type thing. Mm. And then next thing you know, you're like, oh, I guess this is what everybody does. Yeah. Especially growing up in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania, mm. um, you know, it's, it was, you're introduced to all these other guys that have different cultures, different backgrounds that maybe they've been, they, maybe they drank in high school, and now they're in, or they dip, you mm -hmm. know, try that, listen to throw up everywhere like just you know it was kind of just sensory overload um and trying to take everything in um and then still trying to be a professional athlete mm -hmm. which isn't easy um so 2006 7 2007 I had Tommy John mm -hmm. with Atlanta um so then that just started like my, my drinking more um, just out of like depression, you mean? Like uh, you were just so drinking after games kind of became mm. a thing, just because at that level, your brain doesn't really shut off after a game, especially if you don't have a good game, or even if it's a if it's a good game you want to celebrate. Mm. If it's a bad game, you want to yeah, forget, forget about it. it. Yeah. So you start to like medicate with that, mm. um, and then before you know it, you know that leads to decisions to where. Um, anxiety, depression start to build up. So to fight that, you just drink more. Um, always never feeling good enough, you know. Um, and that just snowballed, kept going. And then 2009, uh, I was out of options. So you have a certain amount of options that you can be sent down and back up where they still can maintain you. The team can can have your rights and so I was out of options so if they sent me down I was going to have to be paid pretty much like big league salary to be sent mm -hmm. down um, well they were putting Tom Glavin back on the roster so I got released because I was just coming back from Tommy John um, JJ Bacolo was my scout and Dayton Moore who was the GM of Kansas City um, they were both with the Braves when I was there so they knew uh, about me and um, I ended up going to Kansas City and getting a chance there. Uh, started in Double A, so you know after being at the big league level and stuff, going mm. to like that is humbling. Yeah. Um, so it just it kind of refired me to to be a mentor to the younger guys because that's what I had with the Braves with Tim um, was you know 
trying to help them, take care of them, be a leader. Um, and I ended up getting back to the big leagues from Double A at the end of that September. And then through some really awesome games at the end of the year, and then the next year with Kansas City, got sent down, uh, I think it was the day before the season in Kansas City. They went mm. with a left-handed pitcher instead mm. of the, they wanted one more lefty instead of a, so that was another roller coaster year. Yeah, um, and it was in Omaha was their Triple A, um, so it was fun to play play there um, in that league. But drinking is, you know, I'm six to twenty four beers every night. Wow. So being competitive and then also getting into alcohol and that kind of stuff is not good because you start to like oh I can drink more new type yeah, thing so yeah. and um I'm kind of a big guy so it was it wasn't very hard for me to drink like a yeah. case of beer yeah and it wasn't like you know so from 2015 or 2005 to 2015 I probably had one month in those 10 years where I didn't have an alcoholic beverage so I was a functioning alcoholic, alcoholic. Yeah. um and went to Kansas City those two years um, I would play winter ball in the winter time. So Puerto Rico had a team 2008. I played there for the Arecibo Lobos. Then I played in Venezuela um, for the Magallanes Navagantes. And I ended up throwing a no hitter there. Hmm. And when I did that, there was a Japanese scout and a, a South Korea scout there and all that stuff. And I was on the roller coaster ride in the States and, um, I got an offer to go over to Japan. Mm. So, um, which isn't bad anymore. I mean, I think back in the day, mm -hmm. it was almost like, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is your consolation price for, for being yeah. in the major fold. But they pay pretty good now. It's a decent league. Oh yeah, they're pretty uh, obviously at a at a level of skill that we didn't. I mean, with Anichiro and like, I mean, mm -hmm. he's going to be the first Hall of Famer ever from yeah. Japan. But and should be <laughs> Otani now? Yeah. Like, oh my god. <laughs> You can do it all. Babe Ruth guy, base yeah. pitches and hits. Yeah. And and is that difficult because you just don't get to hit enough? Be well, of course, he gets to play position, so he can play every day. But yeah. I guess probably the problem is it's so precise to hit at that level that if you only get to hit every four games, you just not your chops yeah. are going to be weak because I yeah. I don't get to do it as often. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. He uh, that guy's special. Yeah, but Japan, you know, going over there was a breath of fresh air because it was guaranteed contract, and mm -hmm. um, you know, they drive on the d other side of the road there, which yeah. it, and they play in domes a lot. So mm. sometimes you'd get back and you'd be driving out of the dome and it'd be late or whatever, and you'd be like, "Oh, where am I?" And you <laughs> have to get on the right side. Why of the everybody road? trying to kill me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, but it was a lot. It was a good experience. Uh, wife and family were over there. That's fun. But I guess. Yeah, they don't they don't dip over there, so mm. they smoke cigarettes. Okay. And I was actually over there the year of the tsunami that happened. They don't, as in it's not their tradition, or they won't even let you. Well, like you can't get it unless you go to like a military base. Oh. But like the packs of cigarettes were like two dollars instead of like seven dollars. <laughs> so that like introduced smoking. Okay. Because like they actually have a break at the fifth inning where the umpires. And the hitter, everybody smokes cigarettes. Like, everybody. <laughs> That's great. And, like, so you're in the locker room, and it's just, like, a fireball. Of uh, smoke. Like, they have smoke rooms now yeah. with, like, these machines, but it just reeks in there. But, yeah, like, the fifth inning is a five-minute break that I wasn't used to. Yeah. Um, and the umpires and everybody go just throw a <laughs> lung dart down. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> wow. So you are still in a professional mm -hmm. baseball player. Yeah, now, player. now an international yeah. professional. Um, played there. We actually won the Asian, Asian series over there. So I got like a like World Series, the right? World Series nice. ring for Asia. That's cool. Um, with them, which was yeah, it was yeah. it was awesome. But I just spent one year there, then went to South Korea and played with the uh, Kia Tigers, and uh, that was more. The fans in other countries are a lot different than the fans in the states. Mm. Like in Venezuela, they're nuts. Like. It's awesome. It is loudness yeah. all the time. It's not, you know, like in the States, it's like, oh, quiet when mm. the pitcher's going to mm -hmm. pitch. It isn't like that mm. anywhere else. So that was something that kind of was different but awesome, um, the way the fans would interact with the game. Like, it was, they loved it, you know. Um, 
they have these boom tubes that they're oh, just yeah. always getting hit. They have like a <laughs> chant for every single player when they come up to bat or whatever, and the whole stadium will be singing it. Um, cheerleaders on top of the dugout type thing. Um, so that was that was definitely different. And in, in the domes in Japan, it was so loud. Mm. Um, but in South Korea, it was Japan was more like military baseball. Like I, I remember throwing my first bullpen, being done, going to run, going in lifting, getting like a massage or something, leaving, and the guy that I started throwing my bullpen with was still throwing his bullpen. Wow! It's like a three-hour bullpen. What? Yeah. So a different way of managing how they yeah. made their athletes do what they do, mm. which might be. Superior, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe uh, they're, yeah. uh, if if they're not having arm injuries right. or whatever, then maybe they're onto something. Yeah. I mean, and they are they are built different, like from okay as far as like their muscle muscle tissue and their their bodies. You know, the, Koreans in uh, general or Asians, Asian. I would say. Yeah. Um, so you know, you see American guys and you, they're like big, and mm. some of these guys aren't big, but like they can repeat the same action over and over and over again without getting hurt they're more like lean and and cut kind yeah. of as and the food to you know stick. the food doesn't have the food's amazing yeah. like it, you know when i came back to the states and it would eat like pizza for the first time yeah. i'd be like oh, now we're the we're the worst eaters in i the world. couldn't even eat a piece nah, we're you know what i mean like it was the food is so much different um oh. so much cleaner yes we're so unhealthy in the united states <laughs> no we are i oh, mean yeah, i learned no, that I, yeah. I have a cholesterol thing and so i had to change my diet and <clears> if you actually try to eat healthy it's hard well and it costs way more yeah, to eat exactly healthy. Yeah, like it it's does. like if you go to get healthy food here it's like it's super expensive well let's talk about health because you ended up I guess somewhere in the midst of all this in an accident and mm -hmm. that kind of changed I guess everything for you in, in ways that you couldn't have anticipated so you can tell us a little bit about that yep so I got to a, a point in my life where I thought I I had everything that you're supposed to acquire you know if you're living for yourself in the world um, I had 15 cars I had wow. I, I had a house I had two three-wheelers two four-wheelers two mopeds two dual sport bikes i could never get a crotch rocket because did you buy anything for your wife <laughs> did she get any steak knives something <laughs> yeah. yep <laughs> uh the house you know the house and then you know money saved up for the kids to go to school so like you know i i had this is my life this is mm. but i got to a point where i started to um i was empty mm. like it was just rinse and repeat party mm. um go to sleep wake up go play baseball start to feel better around like the seventh inning because of being hung over and then be like what are we doing going to party yeah and going back so it was like rinse and repeat the same thing had all this stuff and it like wasn't happy and so started to question god and be like you know what is my purpose grew up in church you know but it was one of those things where you go so There's you always consider yourself a christian though oh yeah i was yeah. the worst christian ever for yeah. the longest time because i'd be i would say i was a christian i'm just off the path <laughs> I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm just all God will give me grace, though. That's what Jesus is all about. Thank, no, I, I've been, well, I mean, thank God he's such a, a merciful listen, God. Listen, I had you know? a prodigal journey early. In, I grew up in the church, and sometimes that's a double-edged sword mm -hmm. because you know God for a long time, but it's almost like you're like, I don't know. What else is out there? I never got a chance to taste yeah. you know, the forbidden fruit, and the truth is the forbidden fruit tastes good or you wouldn't want it. Mm -hmm. You're not addicted because you hate drinking. You're addicted because I like the feeling. Yeah. There's a value to it. It's dark. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not going to heal you. It's mm -hmm. going to destroy you. But it works for a second yeah. or you wouldn't do it. And yeah. so it's, it's, it's a false sense of peace yeah. uh, when, in fact, what you're really trying to do is fill a space that isn't being fed. But yeah. you believed you're a Christian. You were obviously allowing the world's take on how to get through life uh, as your impetus to get through things. You got used to it. Subtle, casual compromises along the way mm -hmm. that ended up becoming your lifestyle. You probably didn't even notice mm -hmm. or seeing it, or maybe you talked yourself out or convinced yourself you were in good shape. Oh, yeah. We all do, of course. Yep. 
Uh, we don't want to deal with the conviction of God. And, if you, and at least you had that, probably. Yeah. And so that means you were a true believer. And you say, hey, you keep this up. Yeah. Just letting you know. Yeah. Yeah, I was definitely, like, I was, I would say I was a Christian, but I was, I was my own God. I was living for myself, yeah. you know. And so I um, started to question him, had a lot of easy signs looking back on it. So now I pray for easy signs because I'm, I'm stupid, you know <laughs> okay. what I mean? Like, I'm like, God, please give me easy signs because yeah. I'm like, I'm going to screw it up for <laughs> yeah. sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, but, uh, you know, got pulled over drinking, not pulled over. I went to a gas station, got there, didn't have my wallet. This was like after probably drinking like a handle of vodka wow. and a thousand horsepower Camaro. Cop pulls up. You've been drinking? Yes, sir. And he's like, can you leave your car here? I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> Where was uh, this? Uh, in Pennsylvania. Okay. So you're in the U.S., right? Yeah. Like close to Amish, Amish oh, country. Okay. Yeah, like where this kind of wood comes from, right? Oh, it's yeah, nice wood. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, you know, that should be a wake-up call. Mm-hmm. Wasn't, you know, kids be in the car. I go to the beer distributor, like, pff, open up a can of beer. Like, anywhere I went, I had a beer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was questioning God, and then uh, one day got back from playing and took one of the bikes out to run it. It wasn't running right because it had sat the whole year while I was playing. And uh, it was it's carbureted. It was an older bike, and there's now looking back on it, there's two carburetors in that bike. One for like around idle, and one for like when you're ripping it. And so I took it out, and I was running it hard, and it started to clean up and stop like sputtering, and it was running good. <clears throat> I got to a parking lot, which would be like a Publix, and like a CVS, like on the side of it, and it, uh, but it was giant and a uh, Rite Aid. You know, it's just different names, but the same kind of style as what's down here. Um, and got to the parking lot and was like, should I go to McDonald's or should I go home? I was like, I'll go home. Um, turned, looked down, saw two. So two mile an hour, and the but, but the bike stalled because it wasn't, it was the lower mm. jet, and that one was still gummed up. Well, when it stalled, it locked. I was going so slow that the tire just locked, and I wasn't ready to pull in the clutch because I wasn't, planning on the bike turning mm-hmm. off and it just kicked me off to the side i put my leg down and it snapped in half wow <clears throat> so there i am <laughs> trying to pick up the bike and i couldn't get it picked up and i looked down and like my leg is out to the side um so I kept trying to pick it up and kept losing my balance because i was hammered yeah you know didn't want to get a dui right. so i like throw my leg over my other leg, army crawl through the right aid of, like, through the drive through of the right aid to back behind, like, a dumpster. Call my wife. I was like, hey, like, she said, I said, like, my leg's off or something. Come get me. <laughs> my leg's off. Yeah. And um, <laughs> she grabs the kids, comes to get me. She's there within, like, seven minutes. The, the store is just right up mm-hmm. from the house. Um, comes to get me, and... I get up, hop into the into the car, and like my legs just flapping, and um, mm. call my buddy that's a tow truck driver. Um, rest in peace. He's no longer with us. Uh, Colson. Um, he he went got the bike, you know, and for nobody to even see any of that or any of that is crazy. You know what I mean? There's usually always somebody around or something that would see something like that. Sure. So it was. I think it was, you know, some prevenient grace right there um, because had any of that kind of stuff happened, it would probably make it a lot more difficult to try and do what I'm doing now. Mm. But that's why I want to share yeah. what I've been through is because, you know, I always had people trying to tell me, like, hey, you need to chill out or you need to do this. But I, I knew it was best for me, right? And I didn't, didn't want to listen to them. And I quickly found out that I should have probably listened to them. Um, and had a better foundation and priority. Um, but like I said, my priority was myself. So they, I go to the hospital. They can't operate on me because I'm like four times the legal limit or something. So I'm sitting there, <laughs> just sitting there with a broken leg, just like thinking about everything. Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> they put a, a rod in when they finally could operate, and it was going to be like six weeks. So I was like, oh, I'll, be, I'll get back. You know, um, six weeks go by, my leg's in a lot of pain, and um, I go in, and I'm like, I'm 
in a lot of pain, and then they're like, oh, nothing's wrong. Like, they check my blood, all that stuff. Nothing's wrong. Okay. Like, I'm like maybe I'm just being a wuss. Mm. Like, I've never broke a leg before. I had mm. Tommy John, like, mm. so I know, you know, rehab and all that kind of stuff, what you have to do to get back, and the amount of pain that I was in thinking, like, you're going to break my arm. They're like, nope, we're good. Mm. And they just, like, start to straighten it out, yeah. like, after it's not wanting to straighten out. But range of motion is key. So they're like, we got to get this thing straight. And they're yanking on it. Um, so I'm like, well, maybe I, I've never broken a leg. Maybe this is just what it is. So I, I kind of just dealt with it. Um, go back in probably like a couple weeks later in a lot of pain. And uh, they're like, okay. So they, they go in. I go into the hospital. And they put like this sponge thing in and drain it um, in there for like a week. Blood still doesn't show infection. They're like, it's not infected. Um, so that goes on for five or six surgeries. They they go in. I go in. They drain it out. I'd be in the hospital for like a week. Go home. It'd be good for about two weeks. Start to like swell back up. Get super painful. Um, I, I saw other doctors um, that were in the same clinic type thing. Uh, and... They were like, I think that rod needs to come out, but like your blood doesn't show infection. Mm -hmm. And so um, then I got basically accused of just wanting more pain medicine. Mm. Um, you know, even accused my wife of you got you just want more pain medicine. And I'm like, no, like I'm in pain. Yeah. Like I like I can usually deal with pain pretty yeah. good. Um, I hit a lot of pain as a childhood, like when I was a child, because yeah. like. I could show up with like bruises and they'd be like, what'd you do? And they're like, I know if I said what I did, <laughs> yeah. I would be getting in right. more bruises, right. you know, or more punished for doing something stupid. Right. So right. I'd just be like, oh, I don't know what I did. Yeah. Um, so I got really good at blocking out pain. Um, went to Hershey Medical Center, which is like where Hershey candy bars mm -hmm. are from. Um, the doctor there basically looked at the x-ray. It was like, Rod's got to come out tomorrow. Or you're going to lose your leg if you didn't already. Wow. And I was like, what? Yeah. I was, and, you know, this whole time I kind of knew something was going on yeah. because of the pain I was in. Um, but when I would go to the doctors, they were like, your blood doesn't show infection. Like, it's not infected. Yeah, weird how they, they, two different doctors look at the same thing and one guy is to completely missing it. Yep. But it's life altering, this mm -hmm. miss. Yeah. Right? So this yeah. guy immediately said, nap. Screwed up. That's well, what, yeah. Dr. Spencer Reed at Hershey Med, the man, he uh, he put it to me like this because he, he knows I'm kind of, you know, not the smartest. So he put it in baseball terms for me. He's like, basically, um, you were at a minor league hospital. Mm. They can't hit the curveball. Wow. Your leg is a curveball, and we're a big league hospital. We smashed the curveball. Uh. <laughs> and I was like, makes sense. Yeah. Like, can't smash my curveball, but I'm glad you can get this one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he put it in terms of where I could understand yeah. it. Um, so emergency, I went, that was my birthday uh, that I went to the doctor to see him. So I found out on my birthday that surgery seven was going to be taking the rod back out. Um, the infection was on the rod, essentially. So it's inside my body. Okay. Um, Infection was on the rod when they put it in. Um, wow. So he, and then come to find out they make antibacterial rods. Wow. But because it, my accident happened off the field, no insurance, no contract. Mm. Um, so they just went probably what was the cheapest. Like which was the Walmart the, version. Yeah, yeah, which was the non-antibacterial rod. It's like, why, why don't you just put that one in to begin with? But that still should have been prepared prior yeah. to insertion at least go through whatever yeah you know sterilization there should be doing yeah but yeah and then yeah but it's still just still just so happened to have something on it i dang. guess and um so they removed the rod and then i got this lizard frame on so it's like an external rod with all these pins and stuff mm. going on. so i woke up with that on my leg now during this time questioning god broke my leg we found a church um it was new life New Life Assemblies of God, and uh, my wife can help me uh, in East Berlin. Hmm. East Berlin, I think. Yeah, Pennsylvania. Um, and when I went in there, <laughs> doctor, or yeah, doctor, I, he should be hmm. considered a doctor for how he was, I mean, everything he was saying, Joel Everhart, he was just hitting me right in the forehead. 
Like, do you have stuff to store stuff? Like, because you have all this stuff, and I'm just like, like, did somebody set me up? Yeah, here? like, yeah. what's going on? So, really, it was the first time I was hearing the gospel in a way that I was understanding it. Um, There's tons of baseball chaplains and stuff like that, but those, and not because I'm sure people can get whatever they can get when they need it, but I was only hearing the same thing from them, which was like they don't do these certain things anymore ever because they're holier than thou mm -hmm. or whatever. And it was just rinse and repeat. Mm. And I would ask questions and would get generic answers. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the first guy that like I'd ask questions and he'd just be straight up. Like, yeah, like if I slam my finger in a car door, like, something's going to come out. Mm -hmm. Like I can't, like I'm just, I'm, I, I still mess up. I'm a sinner. Like I'm not perfect. And I'm like, okay, I get it. <laughs> I can do not perfect. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, so I wake up with this cage on my leg. I actually, uh, so it wasn't this surgery, but it was the next one I told. So the, the bone didn't heal with, even with the cage on because mm -hmm. it was dead. Oh. So they had to go in and remove an inch of bone. Um, and so I'm patient zero for this procedure. Mm -hmm. And they go in, remove an inch of bone from here, and cut the bone up top here. And then there's like three pins holding that bone in place and like this lizard frame that basically all the pressure is off of that. That bone's just floating in there. And um, I woke up from that surgery and basically told the doctor just to cut my leg off mm. because they couldn't find any veins. I'm usually pretty in shape, like all this stuff. Couldn't find any veins on me to get any IVs. Like had to find one somewhere like in my leg, um, which is weird. Um, and so like, and like I was dying, you know, and um, my wife, she was like, do you want, I woke up from that surgery and she was like, do you want to listen to the church service? And I was like, oh, I want to, I want to be able to understand it. Like I just woke up, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had any surgeries, but you wake mm -hmm. up from them. You're kind of yeah. just like a little, like everything's moving quick. Yeah. And, uh, I was in a lot of pain cause I had all this stuff on, in my leg and they just removed an inch of bone, but she put her phone over by the window and like five minutes later, just started playing. And, like, I kind of, like, I remember spinning to look at her to tell her I didn't want her to play it. And she's sitting right beside me in the chair. And she's like, my phone's over there. I didn't touch it. And I was like, what? And it just started playing. And it was how it was a service on Jesus going to the cross. And, you know, everything he kind of did for us. And how as he was going through everything that he was going through, he suffered well. Right? Mm -hmm. And, like, mm -hmm. here I am not suffering well i did everything to myself and i kind of just like i don't i don't something came over me i lost it. i started crying and i i said god if you can if you can heal this i'll tell everybody and um that was the life life-changing moment you know i died to myself that day in that hospital room and uh started to live live for god after that and tell everybody like my whole demeanor changed like i'm going around with this cage on and before i'd be like why me type thing mm -hmm. and then it became like now i started to see all this different stuff like i needed to be grateful because like i i still had my leg and there's people that are coming in without their leg on there's people mm -hmm. that are coming in in way worse situations mm -hmm. than i was in and then even going in to the doctor's office like sitting outside just overhearing some conversations of people um being like well a doctor doesn't know what he's doing this kind of stuff like and i'm looking at him and kind of judging him because i'm just like well i know that you're probably not doing what the doctor's telling you to do but you're going to go in there and put your problems and how often do we do that yeah. we go into the doctor's office we put our problems on him not knowing what he's gone through mm -hmm. that day so I kind of went in that day and I just gave him a hug and said, thank you. And he was kind of like, he was like, what? And I was like, I just want to say thank you. I was like, you know, I just feel like, you know, the Lord put it on my heart to do that. Cause a lot of people come in here and with their problems, they don't know what surgeries you just went. You might've just tried to save a kid's leg and couldn't or worse. I don't know, but 
I said, I just wanted to hug you and say thank you. And um, that was that was awesome. I thought, you know, my purpose after my accident was kind of, after coming to God, was he was going to use me to get back to baseball mm -hmm. to kind of go present it at, on that table. Mm -hmm. um, so it ended up being 14 surgeries in two years. I had that cage on my leg for two years. Um, regrew the whole inch of bone. There was like, mm. there were studies. Um, so they actually paid me to, to study my leg, which I think was just released last year, which I, I want to So nobody get. had ever created that technique or they had done it, but they weren't sure if it was panning out and you are mo almost like a, a, a proof of concept or so did like, something happen that shouldn't have happened? They're like I was stunned. Like the prime candidate <clears throat> for testing to see i guess if this procedure would work to the extent that what it was going to have to work at like mm. as far as so this was extreme version of this technique and suddenly yeah. it's panning out for you yes nice so um you know they'd hook all there'd be like 15 people in like the hospital room with me hooking all sorts of stuff up and then i'd have to walk mm. and it was basically showing what was going through my leg and what was going through the bone um, yeah, I didn't even know bone could do that. So there's a gap, and it literally will just re go. Yeah. So like these three pins. So if you cut, they cut the inch of bone out here. These three pins, I'd click this clicker three times a day. So I had to have a pick line put into my heart too, because the antibiotics that I was on would just destroy your regular veins. Mm. So three times a day, I was putting antibiotics into my heart, mm. and it, they were refrigerated, so it was crazy because wow. it would make your chest cold. And um, so that was for nine months I had the pick line in. And so three times a day doing that. And after you would do that, you would just you'd be wiped. And then by the time you felt better, you'd have to put another bag on. And so. Um, and it seems like such an odd accident. I mean, you put your leg down and what happened was so extreme mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, I was going 60 and I Blew off and hit a guardrail, but you, oh, I yeah. just put my foot down, and yeah. then I ended up with two years of. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, God, God knew what I needed. Yeah. He knew I needed. That. So He did this to you. Uh, sounds like I'm blaming God, but oh, obviously no. He's integrated into our life. There's no accidents. Yeah. Just providence. Yeah. He's involved. Yeah. There's purpose. There's reason. You know, I've always believed, or no, I can't say I've always believed, but I've learned uh, that when we go through pain, which we all do. It's an honor. Yeah. So like God says, if you're one of his, mm -hmm. and maybe he's using it to bring people to Christ, but let's say you're a believer like you. I think what he's saying is, I'm going to trust you with this pain. Mm -hmm. Because A, I know you're going to get through it. B, I know what you're going to learn on the way out. And C, it's your crucifixion. Mm -hmm. I'm going to crucify you for two years. You're going to be pulled down from the cross. You're going to die. You're going to be resurrected. And your story, your healing, your experience, your history is going to heal thousands and thousands of other people because that's what the, the cross is. One, yeah. di one death, one resurrection, trillions of people saved. And he says, now it's your turn. Mm -hmm. So tell me, you know, what do you feel the spiritual... Um, lesson is, but more maybe maybe equally important. And what is it that God is saying? Now it's your turn to pass this on. What does that become? Has it become a ministry for you? Has it become just simply the way you live your life now? Or is there something even more unique that has come out of this that you feel is, makes sense now? Now that you're on this side of it, as to what your purpose is moving forward. Well, I think he 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 knows all of our hearts, and. Um, he doesn't give us any more than we can handle. And I think, you know, sometimes when bad stuff happens, like people, they, they do want to blame God or whatever. But there's usually a lesson to be learned in there. And if you can get through it and put your faith in him, the rewards and blessings that come after that pain or that trial or whatever you're going through, if you have resilience and you lean on him, not your own understanding, mm -hmm. like God plays the long game. He doesn't play a short game, and we're we're all about shortcuts, right? Mm -hmm. We we want to take this pill that makes us skinny, like all this stuff, like just do the work type thing, and 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 so um, 
God knew exactly what I needed for me to never want to go down that path again. Um, and you it know, seems a little over the top. I think it's exactly what I needed. You know, I mean. Well, I mean, I'm just saying. I'm trying yeah. to be human for a second and yeah, say, yeah. God, seriously. I mean, six months maybe, but come on. Yeah, you know, I, I I know for a fact that if it would have been six weeks and I healed, I would have been back to doing the same thing. Um, I know that if I didn't go through everything that I had to go through with the pick line, with thumping that stuff into my heart, with feeling like I was dying, um, being, you know, on blood thinners that weren't really regulated, knowing that I could have got a blood clot. Mm -hmm. um, all this kind of stuff, which is kind of funny too, because they're like, it's like they found that out that the blood thinners like was not right, and then it's like, had I died, like there was a case, yeah. but because I didn't die, it was like when you run a stop sign and there's not a cop. Yeah. Like you know, right, what I mean? right. Like it was just like I was like, oh well, you're still alive, so you're good. So, but but during the two years, mm -hmm. I mean, were there moments? Where you just were like, God, I, I'm done with this. This is this ain't right. This is unfair. Or do you feel like right kind of off the get go, something had changed and you started accepting it? Or do you did you have moments where you're just like, Come on, this is this is this ain't right. Well, up until that surgery, where I told God that I would tell everybody if and uh, and I heard that suffering, you know, and how he suffered well. Ever since that point, I made it an obligation to myself to suffer well. So like every, from the whole time from surgery, you had already made that decision from surgery eight on okay I was like even though this cage is on my leg like there's a lot worse stuff out there yeah and like so I started to try and put myself in other people's shoes more, yeah um, and not make it so much about me um, and you know everywhere I would go I would I would start to to share mm. um, and then actually called Tim. So during all that time in the hospital, I will say this as well, all, all the people that I became friends with, I admitted the camera of this, like, that I thought were cool and that I wanted to hang out with, um, that I put, like, these worldly people above family, all this kind of stuff. Whenever something goes down like that, that's that's compromising to what they're going to be able to receive from you again, they will scatter like cockroaches. Um, you know, you think that they love you or that they're there for you, but they're not. Um, they're there for what you have to use you um, and all that kind of stuff. So that being said, all those surgeries I went through, the only people that were there really were my wife and my kids. Um, and God. And God never left me either. <laughs> yeah. Well, so there's people right now watching this. And they're saying, um, no, any right. I, I, this, if this is what God's all about, I'm not interested. I don't think that I should have to endure that. And sure, you're, you got healed, mm -hmm. but I, cancer's still here. Mm -hmm. I'm still eating it, so I don't know, you know. And they're saying, I didn't get your answer. I didn't. So tell them what you would say to them to hang on uh, and to sort of encourage them as to whatever they are dealing with and why you believe it's still worth hanging on to God because he still has an answer they need. Yeah, I mean, obviously me getting what I asked for is a lot different circumstances than a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I know I know people that, you know, blame God for maybe their, their kid was taken from them, you know, and that's a hard thing to kind of go through. Um, but I would say like, there's things that can be, everybody has a testimony, and if we can get over blaming God for those type situations and circumstances, if we can lean on Him and be able to share how it affected you and how you put your faith in Him, you'll start to see the rewards. Like every time I do stuff that God calls me to do, um, which gets a little bit more uncomfortable every time, but every time you do it, you know, you get scared and you want to run away and you want to go back to the, the old you that could self-medicate and all that stuff. But if you push through and you persevere through it, the blessings and the rewards that you'll see that your eyes are open to are amazing.
amazing. There's a lot of there's a lot of parents out there that go through the same thing that you went through, or there's a lot of um, families that have dealt with cancer um, where they lose a loved one. And if you could share how it affected you and how you stayed true to the Lord and had your faith in Him, you'll see that you know there's a lot of benefit to helping other people and love and like he'll bring people into your life that you would never think that could be possible um and he'll use you um to be his hands and feet and you know that's that's what i want to do and like i said i thought it was for me to get back to the big leagues and be able to share everything um and show people how i changed but i actually i called tim and it, when I told him I came to God, it was like the prodigal son story. Mm. You know what I mean? He was just like, oh, man, that's great. Yeah. Like, he knew um, what I was going through. Everything I, I acquired being the wrong steward of, all those cars, without contract, without um, insurance, because I still had to pay for all the surgeries. Everything that I planned out my life to be was given back. Um, so anytime money got low, a car would sell. Anytime money got low, a car would sell. Money would be getting low. $500 would show up in the mailbox. Mm. No, no, no nothing. Mm. Like, And you attribute that to God saying, I'm really here. Uh, I, I do have a purpose for your life. It's not always going to be exactly what you thought. But either you believe me or not, and this is more important to you than that stuff, but make a choice. It's me or it's your thoughts. But one of those you're going to have to choose because that's where you're at. I mean, the discipline and the expectation to be a true believer, I think, has simply not been expected of American Christians. And I just think those days are over. God is mm -hmm. simply saying, you better get all in. Yeah. Because this, either you believe me or don't. But if you do, act like it. Yep. Yep. And, and that's the biggest thing, really, is you have to live it. You know, you can't just, you can't be like, oh, I'm going to be here and then not here. Yeah. Um, that's why I wear, well, you know, a lot of stuff that I wear is because it, it holds you accountable mm. and you need to be held accountable yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, I'm in debt to God for mm -hmm. what he did by sending his son to the cross Amen. to sit. Because, like, God has wrath. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, read the Bible. Like, yeah. it's not a lot of preachers, yeah. you know, they don't, they don't want to say that because they want to keep people in yeah. the church and if they're real to people in the church those people aren't going to go to that church anymore because deep yeah. down inside they don't want to hear that no. they want to keep living their cushy life right. and doing the stuff that they want to do not what not what the god's calling them yeah. to do and so um i found my purpose when i was actually i got back to playing in venezuela so I called tim and he was like prodigal son story come down to my farm in, in Hertzboro, Alabama and rehab your leg and help me with my baseball facility in Phoenix City. And so me and the wife were like, yep, and rented our house out to this um, Air Force family, just came along, the perfect renters. I mean, they came in, white glove, like mm. pulling the oven out, clean, like taking care of our house mm. better than we did. Like, and so when your eye, when, you, when your blinders are off and your eyes are opened, you start to see how God's worked in your life or how, what could be. And, um, I mean, I'm not supposed to have a leg or necessarily be alive. And the doctor, you know, at Hershey Medical Center, I had a lawyer and they're both like, I don't know how you're alive or that you have a leg. But I got I got back to playing professional baseball. Mm. I don't have any pins or anything in my leg. Like I got completely heal healed. And I hear what you're saying about the the people that don't get those answers. Mm. And I think that they still have a testimony if they can suffer well. Like my grandma. Mm. Like she she never lost her faith when she was hairs falling out, can't eat, chemo bone cancer my mom's having to take care of her she's living with my uncle like and she just started you could just see it but she never once faltered you know and i think 
that's what we have to remember is that it lean on not our own understanding. Um, where if we if we were supposed to understand God's purpose for everything, yeah. then it wouldn't be worth worshiping. Well, and I think maybe the most important aspect of that story is um, the hardest thing for the human is to be at peace when things are rough. I don't have to teach you how to be at peace when things are peaceful. Mm -hmm. I don't have to teach you how to be kind when somebody's kind to you. I don't have to teach you how to trust that things are good when everything's going good. Mm -hmm. What humans need to figure out is what do I do when the storms are here? How do I be at peace then? Because if I can learn that, I want that thing because mm -hmm. that's the thing we don't understand. And there are no Bible verse that makes it off better. And there is no, it's either this is real and I'll accept whatever. You know, the Chinese Christians go to uh, a, a prison mm -hmm. and they say, thank you for allowing me to share in your suffering. Share mm -hmm. in your suffering, which is kind of what you were saying. Yes. And I think that that idea is foreign to American Christians. The rich people are the ones that have the least amount in heaven because we trust that instead of God. It's hard to do, especially when you're really in pain, when mm -hmm. you really are in difficulty. It's hard. Yeah. And God's like, who said it was going to be easy? I don't understand. You think the cross is easy. Yeah. But in the end, you're going to be dead a lot longer than you're alive. In other words, you're going to be in the eternal realm mm -hmm. compared to this little moment. Uh -huh. So in the end, you do win. You will be healed yeah. in the end. But for right now, you have a, a role to play in my in my tapestry of, of the human experience mm -hmm. that I'm going to ask of you. And you can either join me or not, yep. but you will be expected to endure what I've given you. This is the way it works. I don't run the show. He runs the show. Well, Amen. folks, this has been an amazing interview. I, I, I so appreciate you giving me this opportunity to talk about your life and explain it and give people hope and inspiration. I do have subscribers who jump in and become part of the Mighty 10,000, which is the Militia of the Mind people who actually identify as believers and or Americans who care about our nation. Don't worship it, but they're grateful for it. And so it's three bucks a month. Uh, I have a special, uh, I will ask a, a question that is only on the other side of the paywall, so I'm going to ask you a question uh, that you just answer as you choose, but um, you can only get to see it. If you join the Militia of the Minds, three bucks a month. So uh, if you can't afford that, then get a job. <laughs> Jump in. So I want to know who is the most well-known batter you ever faced. And I want to hear uh, your most successful uh, uh, conclusion uh, to somebody that we would all know and go, yeah, let me tell you the time I struck him out. How, you tell me your story, but I think it would be an interesting to, to think about what it must have been like when you're on that pitcher's mound, it's major leagues, and suddenly here comes whomever, and you're going, I can't believe I'm pitching to this guy right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, probably A-Rob. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, well, only because he was with the Yankees at that point? Yeah, he was with okay. the Yankees, okay. and I was with Kansas City. And um, I started the game. And I ended up getting Chevy Player of the game that game. It was a it was a really good game, and it was in New York. Which you is, starter? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sir. Nice. And so it was in New York, but I got Chevy Player of the game. So I don't know how that worked because they ended up winning. But um, <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, I got them. I got I got them out every time up to bat, but it was always I'd get ahead and then I'd throw him a changeup, <laughs> and the one time. He, he was just running down the first baseline, and he, he yelled at me to throw me a fastball. Like, he, <laughs> like, and I was just like, "Why would I do that?" Like, yeah. But it was kind of like one of those moments where it was just like, "Oh, that was." But I mean, a lot of respect for the guy. Like, intimidating in the box. He's huge. Like, he doesn't. He? Yeah, he's like probably like six five, six okay. six, like built. Yeah. Um. So that was, and then David Ortiz. Mm. I, I could never get him out. Mm. Like I tried the changeup trick on him. <laughs> no, he, he just bloop, drilled it. Right oh. out, okay. right out, right out. Like every time. Um, and then probably the, not to your question, but the purpose that I was yeah. was getting at. Um, when I went to Venezuela and got back to playing, 
a guy came down there. They only hire a couple a couple players from the same, like from the states. You can't mm-hmm. just stack a team. And the guy that came down there had a pray first bracelet on. Mm. I was like, "Where'd you get that?" And he was like, "Oh, Church of the Highlands." I was like, "No way! I go to Church of the Highlands." <laughs> I go, "What campus?" He goes, "Auburn campus." I was like, "What?" <laughs> so uh, that being said, we put our money together there, went out, uh, d- had the clubhouse guy make a hundred meals. Um, it was like spaghetti meals. Wrote "God loves you" on top in Spanish, and went around. And when we saw kids digging through trash or whatever, we'd call them over to the the bus or whatever. We'd pray for them and hand them a meal. Mm. And you know, some of these women that we give meals to, they'd be like, "Come here," and they'd go and they walk us. And right behind the curb, there's two babies sleeping, like on it. And so, like, that was. Mm. A better feeling than throwing a no hitter. Yeah, getting drafted yeah. by the Braves. Mm. That was like, okay, this is the purpose. The purpose, God's purpose for everybody is to to love and to to give back and to share share what we go through that we deal with, so that we're not doing it alone. If mm-hmm. we try and do it alone, like and we stay in our own head, like it's you're going to get destroyed. That's where the the de- that's the devil's playground mm. in there. Mm. So. um I just wanted to make sure I got that. No, that, that's gr- beautiful. The, Who was the, the per- player? Is he somebody we know, or did uh, he? Ever... It was Scott Schumann. Um, I don't. He never, never made got it to the big. big I think he's still actually trying, trying to play okay. and stuff. He throws really hard. He, I think he just had Tommy John mm. a year and a half ago. But Jonathan Albadejo, he was with the Yankees, and he was the one that spoke Spanish and English. That so he was the one that was doing all the talking while we kind of. Mm. Um, so yeah. Hats off to those guys for wanting to help. Serve. Well, and that was off. that was like that's when I found out that like, uh, it's not about me doing yeah, this. There's a bigger story here. It's about me doing that. Well, so. and thank God for Tommy John. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> man. Oh, man. oh yeah. It's I remember sure. when he got that surgery. He was a Dodger. Yeah. So, anyways, but uh, crazy that that took. So he had one of those miracles, and he was a Christian. Uh, yeah, quite a Christian guy. So yep. I don't know if he's still. I hope he's still alive, but I don't know. But anyways. Anthony LaRue, that was an amazing story. Thank you for spending time yes, with us and just sort of telling people the most important story is, is the one that you have because it's, it's real. There's yeah. no, it's not a story about somebody. It's saying, here's what happened to me. Here's where I was. Here's where I went. Here's what God did. I don't know what to tell you, but it, this is how it really panned out in my life, and people can respect that because yeah. uh, an, an, an anecdotal folks. As I said, you know, life is short, and uh, God wins every time. If you don't believe in God, you need to, because it will give you some purpose and some peace, whether you understand it or not. More importantly, it will give you a way to walk through the dark times, which uh, drugs aren't going to work. Uh, they'll make you feel better, uh, but they will not help or heal you, and that's what you're looking for. How do we actually get through this and come out the other side better than we were before? Hard to do, but God can do that. With something We learned something that we're still learning and so while we're here the truth is this jesus is god he came to to earth as a human being proved it they wrote about him people saw it he did miraculous things and proved he was not a cult came back from the dead and that's how you get to heaven by believing on him you don't have to believe that but it's the truth and that's all i have here on bread sign has issues is the truth that's all i got left is to leave a legacy folks remember if you're a Christ follower, you're the last truth tellers on earth. It's crucial that you don't, not only don't apologize for your faith, but are very vocal about it. Because if it's real, you need to tell folks. Amen. And that's just the way it's going to have to be. Remember, if they ever say you're politically incorrect, always say thank you for the compliment. Because the last thing you want to be is someone who censors himself in his belief system or some Marxist nonsense that's destroying the West. Let's be Christians. Christianity created the West. Why don't we continue to follow up in that uh, lineage and see if God will give us a third great awakening? I don't know if he will, but he does expect us to fight for it because that's the God we serve. Be a warrior. It's okay. A warrior that stands for truth. The truth is enough to reach deep into people's hearts and tell them uh, how to get to God. Remember, folks, this is God's comic, Brad Stein. On Brad Stein has issues, always trying to bring you the most interesting guests I can. And I'm doing what I always do. I'm just putting the woke back to sleep. See you next Monday. Thanks again, Anthony. Thank you.